This tape for the Newport Historical Society does not begin uh, until on the tape counter number 10. There was some kind of mistake in the original introduction for the Neighborhoods of Newport Oral History Project. This is May 15, 1984, and I'm Emily Sherman. I am going to do an oral history interview with Mr. Roy McPoland. Um, Mr. McPoland, I'm going to start out with our first uh, interview. It's going to be about you, your family, your childhood, reminiscences about your growing up, your family background, and the first thing I have to know is, what is your middle initial standing for? Your Roy P. Peter. And what was your father's name? Peter. And you are junior. Yeah. And what was your mother's maiden name? Uh, Barbara. You, Costera. Cost Costera. Costera. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to know how many children you have. There were six. And how many are living? Uh, two. And uh, those two, where are they living now? Well, I'm here and my sister is in California. Those are your, your... That's the two surviving. Okay. Now your own children, how many? We, got, uh, we had five. And how many of those are living? Uh, four. And where are they living? Uh, one in Washington. He's a charge of security in the uh, in the uh, State Department, and he travels the world. That makes it interesting when you hear from him. Yeah, and the other son is he's in a security operating out of Richwood, New Jersey. I'll find out later on with uh, uh, their family life, probably. I'll go into that. This is what is called the extended family. It's supposed to find out how many other people are living with you besides your wife. But uh, these children are not living with you, but I think they're definitely part of your extended family. Oh, yes. And the other two children? Well, I've got a uh, daughter. Here in Newport? Yes, right across the street. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. <laughs> yeah. And another one? And uh, on uh, Ruggles Avenue, she's in Newport here. And second daughter? Yeah. Okay. That's very nice. Now, let's start out and find out where you were born. Mm -hmm. I was born in uh, New York City. And, uh, 1900, August the 18th, 1904, at the Presbyterian Hospital. But uh, where, we, where our homestead was in the East Iceland, Long Island. And, and why did your mother come in all the way up to 168th Street? Well, we had no no hospital in the uh, there, and uh, there were too many midwives at the time, as I understand. So that's where we had to come in from, from Iceland to Jamaica and take the electric train from Jamaica to, to Grand Central and then we wind up in the Presbyterian Hospital. Did she ever tell you about those last few minutes getting up there in the hospital? Well, she, she went ahead of time, yeah. Were you the firstborn? Uh, no, I was a, uh, a third, yeah. Or she knew what she was getting into yeah. then. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, how did you happen to be living in Islip? Well, uh, uh, my mother, uh, she came from Prague, on the other side, in the, uh, <laughs> in the communist territory now. And uh, uh, she met my father, she was working in New York, and uh, my father was working in New York. And uh, they went from, after they got married, they went there. She has cousins in Iceland. So she wanted to go to Iceland because 
uh, that's uh, Bohemian territory, and my mother is Bohemian. She, and that's why she wanted to go to Iceland. And then, of course, when my father uh, quit his job in New York, he went to, uh, to Iceland, uh, East Iceland, and he was, his employment was in East Iceland and uh, in Great River. Well, now, where was he born? He was born in Highland Falls. So he That's was a, not first generation no, over. No, no, and he's a he's a way back, and of course I say in between time to substantiate this. Uh, so, uh, history goes to about 1860 something in in, uh, in the cemetery that we have with photos of up in Highland Falls. And Highland Falls is next to West Point, and that's where he was born. Uh, where did the name McPoland come from? I imagine from Ireland. Well, we uh, we got a, a next, uh, 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 we first into it, and I had a uh, a priest from the uh, Colombian Fathers in Bristol that I used to pick up an old timer that I used to pick up to go to when I passed through, and he'd go and get his feet taken care of in Providence. And he told me he got talking. He said McPoland, and he says, he says that that originated originally in Scotland. So he sent a letter back and telling him after he checked on it, and he came right back and uh, he said that it was in Scotland, and then your family moved to England, and then from England they moved to Ireland, and that's that's where they got it. Yeah. Now uh, I I am going to find out uh, later on because I happen to know of the. We've established that your uh, father had come from the Palisades part of uh, New York, and uh, he married your mother, who had come over from yeah. Prague yeah, she was, as a young girl, yeah, as an right. immigrant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. To be, she wanted to be with other members of her family. Oh, that's right. In Islip, so they lived in Islip, and. Um, I, were you the only one that was brought uh, over to the hospital to be born, or did she have all of these children? All of them there, but she lost some of them at birth, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then you grew up in Islip for a while? Yeah. And what kind of childhood was that? I know a little bit about Islip. Um, were you uh, near the railroad station? We were right. Our house was backed up on the Long Island Railroad, and uh, every night we'd come down and we'd hear this. This was a steam propelled locomotive, and when it left Jamaica, coming down, and that was known as the Five O'Clock Flyer, and it had all the businessmen, and it ran right from from Jamaica, right clean past our fence at the back door, right down full steam, throwing the steam right down to the end of the Long Island to. Uh, how far did it go then? Right down to River Riverhead, all Riverhead. the way to Riverhead. Yeah, Riverhead, and that's what we saw. And then coming back, and of course we, uh, coming back, we did, the train would stop going to Jamaica, which stopped at uh, at Great River and Islip, uh, not Islip, uh, East Islip, and, uh, and pick up at Islip, and we'd get on there, and then they'd go to the next stop at Bay Shore, and then a couple of incidents there, and after that we'd uh, hit uh, Jamaica. And that was the end of the steam line. The old Long Island is still very much like that now, except it's electric. It's electrified now. <laughs> and and the one thing I could tell you, when we came up there, we had to, uh, when we got off, we had to wait for the electric train to, to go, to get in the right train to go into the Grand Central. And uh, uh, they had uh, uh, the Italian people there, uh, the women, they had big pretzels, oh, about as big as a saucer. And they had them on sticks, and they were selling the pretzels for a penny a piece. And my sister and I would take the pretzels, and we chew on those pretzels until we got to New York City, <laughs> until there. So that's what we had. We didn't have candy at those days, no. but uh, we uh, chewed on the pretzels for a penny a piece till we got to the Grand Central, and then of course we, that was a. Well, now you went into Grand Central. How long did you live in uh, Islip? Well, I lived. Uh, I can't remember the. Uh, uh, the dates, but uh, uh, we moved. Uh, my father changed jobs, and he uh, then we moved to uh, 86th Street, between Lexington and the Third Avenue. 
Did you know that's very fashionable now? Well, it wasn't then. I know it wasn't, <laughs> but it is very yeah. fashionable now. That yeah. is the luxurious part of the East Side mm -hmm. now. Now, what did your father do? Well, uh, he came to New York and, uh, and from Islip, and he came in and he got a job as a conductor on the Third Avenue Street Railway. The L or down no, no, on the, the surface? The, car, the surface cars. The surface cars. We used to ride up there and we used to get on the car at night and right up to 125th Street where the turntables was and the round cars. That was the car barn, 125th Street, right just, just side of the hall. So uh, we uh, used to come back there and we'd have, we'd have a, a meal in there, you know, for the conductors they have them. Not free, but we'd have to pay for it. Then we'd come back to the city. And then uh, my bedroom was on, uh, on one side. We had, uh, we had three rooms and the kitchen and dining room on there and right in the corner of a uh, second house from the Third Avenue, when the elevator was there, and every time the elevator come with the, with the lopsided wheels would clink, it would wake you up, but you got used to that. Now the, um, was this a, what is called a, a flat, a, co did, a railroad flat, did you have a floor through in a house, or were you in an apartment building? We was in an apartment building, we didn't have a flat, we had apartments like, uh, I think it was a, a three-story, uh, uh, Brownstone, mm -hmm. uh, what was at that area at that time? I can't remember that. And I went to, uh, I went to say when I was there, I went to St. Augustine School. I think it was uh, 83rd, uh, 83rd or 82nd Street between like on the Third Avenue. And I remember being in one play there before we left New York. And then we left New York. Uh, we came up to Rhode Island, and uh, my father uh, got a job up here with uh, uh, Willie K. Vanderbilt. And the uh, and the farm in Portsmouth. Well, now he had done this. Uh, con he he was really a mechanic if he was a conductor. Uh, how, how did he get a background for farming? Well, of course, originally uh, his trade was a blacksmith. He was the son of a blacksmith. Well, his father. His a, father was father Eben Highland. Was, was a Highland blacksmith. Falls, yes, he was a, he was a blacksmith. He learned a trade from him, and while he was going to school up there, he was an apprentice. And he learned uh, uh, blacksmithing in between. But when he got down to Islip, yeah. there was no blacksmithing. No, 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 nothing there. He was working for a private estate for cutting at the time. So, so it was then that he learned his uh, uh, greenery, his gardening. Yeah. Or was he working in the in the no, lovely he was a stable. garden? He was a, in the stables. Oh, he, he was, was in the stables. stables yeah. Had nothing to do with that beautiful arboretum no, no, that's no, now. No, no. Now there. He was a stables, and then of course. Uh, 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 well, I was, uh, got ahead of myself, but where we had the house, as you recall, uh, uh, Long Island was, uh, was all heavy wooded territory. And my mother being of Bohemian industry, and she could swing that double bladed axe. And uh, uh, Central Islip was a, an insane asylum at the time, but known as a sail asylum at Lake, Lake Grand Concomitant. I didn't it, realize it that. It was just side of that. I don't know what it is now, but it was in the sail asylum there. And uh, I can recall that we were chopping wood, and my sister ran a little ahead picking flowers. And you know how the flowers grow in the wooded areas? And uh, she came running back, and she was all frightened. And now all of a sudden, through the bushes, this big man came in. And my mother looked at him, and she happened to take the take the axe and she says, she said it in Bohemian, but she says as so much as to say, get the out of here or we'll, I'll let you have it. And he looked at it and he turned around and went to the bushes. And a little while after that, uh, two guards from the asylum came looking for that man. That's an incident here. And mother and dad cleaned that, I think it was uh, three acres that they chopped that down. And as I say, right near the railroad tracks. And we only had a small, uh, small house where they, with four rooms downstairs and uh, one room up in the attic. And then, of course, at them, that time we didn't have any toilet facilities. So we had what they used known as an outhouse now, and it was 50 feet from the, uh, from the, uh, from the house. And the summertime wasn't too bad, but the wintertime was uh, when you get that 50 feet, you had to go there. We didn't have any running water outside of the, uh, the uh, uh, door, kitchen door. My father had a box dim and we had an old fashioned pitcher pump. And we always had to have a can of water inside to prime the pump in order to get the water out, out of the thing. 
and that, that that was previous before our assistance came into an existence. You know, they just moved the outhouses they, and moved them, and they changed them around every year, and that's the way the facilities were there. And I can remember that uh, we had the uh, <laughs> uh, uh, flowers uh, growing around. Oh, they always grew very they well grew around, around the privy, around didn't the they? And yeah. the, the, the things that we we had there were the uh, morning glories uh -huh. around there. And of course, during that time, and if everybody in the neighborhood, uh, as I said previous, that they moved the uh, uh, the outhouses to different spots and everybody turned in and filled in and moved the outhouses to their present locality. And then after that, they had clams and beer and then it's like a celebration for moving the house. You know? Isn't that great? I didn't know that yeah, that was well, done that, was that way. That. Now, do, do you think they mixed very much with uh, the rest of the uh, different nationalities, or did they more or less stay with your mother's kinds of people? No, they, they mixed. They mixed. We had a, a, an ice lip, and then, of course, my mother's kind of people. She had, when I used to go out there, they, uh, uh, they mixed well, and he was a, he was a combination plumber and tinsmith at that time. And uh, there were a lot of friends, you know. I used to stay there when I'd go down. I'd go with him to work in the morning. My sister stay with the women folks, and I'd go out with him on a job. And I acquainted with a lot of people. But somebody, they start talking, uh, you know. And I'd look at him, and, and they'd laugh. And he said something about you, you know. And I couldn't understand Bohemian, so I just have to take it as it can. But I enjoyed it very much, uh, immensely. And then, as I talked about the plumber. Uh, he lived in Islip, uh, Mrs. Bim, and uh, they uh, every year uh, before Thanksgiving they buy a uh, pig, a large pig, and they'd raise that pig, and they keep that for a year, and then before Thanksgiving they'd slaughter the pig, and they had uh, a new pig to replace the one they slaughtered, and in the uh, cellar of the house uh, they had a concrete cellar, but in the far end of the cellar there was a door. And it was opened up, and it was all dirt inside. And they had a shelf on the top of the of the cellar floor of about five feet, and about two foot wide of dirt. And when you open that door, it was just like a refrigerator. And that was what the was the, was the coal, what they call the coal pack, because all that cold air was condensed, and they had the blood bush, the bologna, and pig feet and pickles and everything in that locality. They didn't miss anything of that pig, no, the except pig, the squeal. Yeah, that's right. They got. The, they even had the pig's feet, and I like the way they picked the pig's feet. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that was the uh, event of them, and we enjoyed that very much. And we had, we, we used to have a pass through the woods between Islip and and East Life to walk through, and then uh, uh, we enjoyed it very much. And I. Uh, uh, that's about all that I can think of out of Long Island there, and then I did, did you go to Did you go to church? Uh, did you go to a church school out there, or were you too young to go I to was school? Too young. Yeah. You left before school That's time. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was too young because I was born in 1904. The uh, yeah. the uh, two uh, uh, children that were older than you did they go to start to no, school they out were, there? No, they were they were deceased, as I said previously. They oh, were so they were so they were not they any were there. older. Just than as you. I stated that that uh, my sister and I are the are the two survivors of the six right now. Yeah. Um, the um, move into uh, New York, I suppose, was pretty exciting for a child. Do you think you were about five years old? Yes, in 84, yeah, that five, yeah. And uh, you started immediately into the church, the St. Augustine the School. St. Augustine School, that's right. And uh, how long did you stay at that school? Well, we came up here, uh, we left New York in uh, 1909. So it was a very short time short in time, New York. Yeah, short period, very short yes. time. And um, did your father have the job uh, at uh, Mr. Vanderbilt's before he came, or did he come up with his wife? Do you think at looking for a job? No, I think he. Uh, if I get it right, I think he had it. Uh, he had it. Uh, he, he had a job when he came up here. Because yeah. that was a long, long trip to yeah, take yeah, with right. a couple of children that's in those right. in yeah. those days. Yeah. Well, can you remember the trip up? You can't remember, can well, you? I remember coming up on the boat. On the boat? Yeah, on the New York boat, yeah. I can remember that. And then we walked down and walked to my aunt's, and they didn't have any car at the time. And we walked from Long Wharf right down to Connection Street. That's down here. That's a long walk and for we a little one. There at, uh, the boat arrived two o'clock in the morning? Two and a half, uh, two thirty in the morning. 
and uh, we were down there, and then finally we uh, uh, <clears throat> we stayed with my aunt for a, a couple of months until we got an apartment on Cary Street, and uh, uh, we got Cary Street. That was 1909, and uh, I lived on Cary Street from 1909 until uh, uh, 1926 uh, when I got married, and my wife wouldn't come downtown to live with me, so we went from. Uh, from here, and I lived up in here territory, up in the up, up in the uptown district. But now we uh, things changed around, and uh, she's downtown in the fifth ward now. She takes. She, Maybe uh, she likes it better <laughs> since it's not called the fifth ward anymore. <laughs> no, it's the fourth, but we miss it though. Now, one of the things we didn't find out was how did you have an aunt in Newport? The what? How did you have an aunt in Newport? You said your you yeah I had an aunt yeah. and 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 was that a McPoland aunt? That was my father's sister. And how she, had she happened to be in Newport? Well, she she came to Newport and she married her husband. She met him in New York. She came down here on a vacation to visit a cousin of hers. And then she met her husband here. He was a member of the police department. Then then it must have been um, uh, the in the in the family of the. McPolands up in Highland that there was uh, somebody that had come to Newport. Yes. So Somewhere she, she, there. She came, yes. There were some relatives there. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well now, we, we'll start in then uh, to find out your your Newport neighborhood life down on Cary Street. And d immediately you started to go to the pr Parochial school? No, we started to go the first time we started. We started to go to, uh, uh, I went, we went to Cary School. That was on Cary Street between Narragansett and, and Cary Street, Henry R.A. Cary School. And that was a that was a, a city school? That was a city school, that's right. And then I stayed in the city school until the third grade. And then after the third grade, I stayed there and my sister was transferred to uh, to St. Augustine School. She transferred to St. Augustine School for the simple reason that at that time there was a coal shortage and there was no coal in the public schools, but the uh, parochial schools had the coal. So my mother put my sister in there. To keep her warm. She didn't she, care about there. you. So I didn't think about it at that <laughs> time, but after a while I was hanging around too much, but so she, she put me into St. Augustine School. So we uh, uh, we uh, finished up that way and said I got some school and uh, uh, we liked it very much and it's right in the neighborhood and it wasn't far away but in those days we had uh, uh, the school from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and then we had an hour and a half at dinner and we had to go back and then it was 4 o'clock when we got out of school and then of course on Sunday afternoon for Sunday school we didn't go to school like they have after the church masses and all the in all the uh, in all the churches throughout the city, uh, we had uh, an hour from uh, two to three, and everybody had to turn into the for two to three to get those uh, uh, instructions. So that's for that part. So on the on the fifth ward area on here, uh, I did a, a lot of uh, a lot of things since I was uh, small, as uh, so shoveling sidewalks. And uh, speaking of shoveling sidewalks, we uh, had a sidewalk up the top of Cary Street that I had a contract for that every time there was a big snowstorm, I'd have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning if there's snow during the night, midnight after midnight, and clean that sidewalk. And I used to get a dollar and a half for cleaning that sidewalk down to Cary Street and along Spring Street, right to the gutter, clean the sidewalk clean. And for that job, I received a dollar and a half. Well, that was probably very good pay. Yeah, that was pay. And uh, to hit on, on, t on the nail on the head this time, I, uh, a year ago I went by during a snowstorm and these two boys were shoveling the sidewalk. And I stopped up there and I said, fellas, what are you going here? What do you get for this job? I said, do you have to clean it right to the gutter? He said, no, just a half. And, and the driveway, just a path for the driveway from the house. And I said, really get, he said, $12. She says, take it or leave it. So that's how, that's how the, uh, how that story got along. And then uh, other times we, uh, going to school we had time and uh, uh, we used to pick dandelions. There's nobody picking dandelions now. Uh, they're using the spinach. But uh, the dandelions, I used to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, the good days in the spring of the year, and uh, pick the dandelions. Not with the flowers, but without the flowers. Pick them up and put them in the buckets 
and uh, then uh, uh, I'd come home and get ready to go to school. And when I come home at noon time, my mother'd have a four or five buckets, all twelve quart buckets ready for that. And I had customers for the dandelions, and uh, we used to get twenty five cents for a for a, a twelve quart bucket of dandelions, all flushed up. And mother used to flush the dandelions up, and then. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we did she all. never made any wine out of it. Uh, no, not 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 there. Yet, years later we did. Yeah, uh, years later we did. And then uh, uh, other things we went. We had a great time here. We had uh, 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 downtown. It was uh, uh, right in the corner of uh, Carroll and uh, uh, Carroll and Vaughan Avenue, right where there was a dairy lounge, right at the present time, a dairy mart. And there used to be polo ponies there. And we used to cut water because they only had a force at the end of the barn, and we used to cut the bucket of water for the polo ponies. And then they, the polo ponies would go from there down to what they call a Wellington Park, and they'd have a polo match to see it. And finally, they moved over uh, over to Brenton Road, over near the course from the golf club, and we had to go over there. And of course, the transportation was there, and if you didn't have a bicycle, you'd have to walk. But we'd uh, We'd walk over there and we'd get a quarter for feeding the horses, taking a bucket of water and feed the horses after the polo game. Another thing, uh, another thing we had was the uh, was the golf club, was right across from the polo field, and uh, uh, we used to have to walk to there, and we, we'd get uh, we'd get seventy five cents for carrying a big bag for eighteen holes, and that was kind of tough because those bags were heavy at that time. They were. And we were small, and you either did it or you get it, and then. We had a pond uh, of mine where they had to drive over the pond, and if they didn't make it, the balls would go in the pond. And uh, initiation we had there that uh, if uh, you weren't in the pond dumping yourself and you were a, a greenhorn coming in to the golf club to, to be a caddy, uh, you'd get thrown in clothes and all. So everybody had a, knew what was coming, so they just rode and went into the birthday suit to get the uh, get the uh, golf balls in the pond. And uh, that was one of the things that we were around here, and then uh, around the uh, around the drive here, and I can remember my father thinking of my, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but my father used to go black fishing, and at that time they never had any any uh, poles; they had lines. They just wound the lines up and and with a sink and threw them out, and instead of the poles, and they used to catch a lot of blackfish along there, anywhere from the Ocean Drive from Brenton Point right clean over the Coast Guard station at at uh, at Green Bridge. Another thing I did was... Uh, did you fish with him? Uh, sometimes I did, yeah. But most of the times I played with the boys, you know? Uh, um, were there crabs around in those places too? That... Oh yes, there's green fish and crabs on there. And the green fish and crabs uh, uh, were uh, on there now. We used to get the crabs. We used to take and put a net in the, uh, on a barrel hoop and put a, put a piece of burlap and then put a fish in it and then get the green crabs and we'd sell them. But, for thirty-five cents a gallon. Today's price is four fifty a gallon for a, for a gallon of green crabs if you can get if them. If you can find yeah, them. Yeah, but you can't find them. They, uh, they're very scarce. And speaking about crabs, over by Green Bridge, uh, where the old Coast Guard station used to be, that's uh, uh, right by uh, right by where Vernon Reed had the place where he came through in a hurricane, right on the uh, on the ocean side. Uh, there's fresh water meets the salt water, mm -hmm. and there's paddlers over there, big paddler crabs. And they're they the white and blue. I've never seen them. Huh? I've never seen yeah, them. Well, they they they're there, and we used to do the same thing with them. But you'd only get one at a time because they were so quick. So we'd have to watch out and not throw it out too far. And when they get there, we'd have to have a an outrigger to on the handle when they get in to pull it up because he he had those flippity fins, you know, just like uh, paddlers on the end of the paddlers. I've never seen them. In a trouble way, and but if they took care of you, uh, if you got your finger in there, boy, they'd nip your finger right off because they were very quick and very sharp. And anywhere along that drive, and uh, coming along through there, we had the lily pond, which uh, right across from the Hasbury, Hasbury and Gooseberry Beach. And uh, there was two ice houses there. And in the wintertime, uh, the men that weren't working on the private estates, they used to cut ice. And that ice, that ice house would be loaded for the, uh, for the icemen for uh, for the uh, for the summer, before the electric fire refrigerator came. Well, now I think for the, for the younger generation that's going to listen to this a hundred years from now, I think you ought to explain how deep 
that ice got in those days because we don't have anything like that today. Well, and the ice, the thickness of the ice would be anywhere from 18 to 20 inches. And that would be cut in, in blocks uh, 24 inches by 30 inches. And that would be taken up a belt conveyor, a chain belt conveyor, that start loading the down, to, down part, down to the first floor of the ice house, and pack it up in straw in between. After that would be filled, they'd take it up to the next layer and do the same thing with the store. And we had five layers there. And then that was owned by a, an ice company. That was a private concern that was paying for the use of that land because the a person born after 1950 is never going to know how we ever got ice at all. And uh, were there other ice houses in uh, this part of Aquidneck Island? Uh, no, th this was the, uh, Lily Pond was the only ice house on, on, in, in Newport. But uh, 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 Jurgens on the Big Pond, that's down off uh, Valley Road now, it's known as Valley Road, and uh, Bliss Mine Road, there was four ice houses there. And they harvested ice the same way, cut it that same size and put it to stores. What made the belt conveyor work? The gas engines. Some of them had steam, but some of them had the bulldog gas engines when they first came out with a, with a water cooler in there and, and putting right along. And that would move the belt with a big wheel and take the ice up in the, in the blocks and there would be there would be catches on there to hold the blocks of ice and there'd be two men to catch it up there and, and shift the blocks with big uh, uh, hooks. They had about an eight foot hook with a, an eight foot pole with a sharp hook on it that pushed the ice in there and other men would be in part of the ice house to, to level that off. In other words, uh, the ice was all in uniform sizes right there. And as it came down, it, uh, they, in the summertime when they come down, they'd move start from the top and take the ice down the chute, and that would go in the chute and there'd be a bumper there so the ice wouldn't break. Have you any idea when the Lily Pond uh, manufactory stopped? Would that have been in the 20s or earlier than the 20s? Uh, uh, that was uh, uh, earlier the 20s, early, before the 20th, because the ice house caught fire. Somebody set fire to the ice house, and it took a long while for that burn because the ice were the the building was water soaked. It was high, a nice building, but it was water soaked, and it took a long time for that to do. And of course, as the fire did it, it melted the ice came right down. And that filled the filled the lily pond with the one and one, because the water had no place to go. <laughs> so that was that, and that same thing, the same condition uh, went to. Uh, uh, went to Jurgens near the Jurgens greenhouses on Blissmine Road. Now he had a small greenhouse there for his flowers and he'd keep them flowered. He used to cut these flowers and every, he had to keep them uh, well chilled and uh, he'd have a, he'd have two wagon loads going down to take the five o'clock train but out of town with the flowers. In other words, that uh, baggage car, the five o'clock train with the six cars, with the same train, would be loaded with flowers, and that's what they'd have to wait for Jurgens' uh, wagons to come to load that up because that was the that was the thing plus the baggage at five o'clock at night when the train left here. So that'd have to be in there half past four, quarter or five in order to load another cars and check. Now, do you think those uh, went up to Boston, or do you think they went uh, uh, out into uh, New England? They, no, the, 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 the train was to the, Fall the, River. The, the, the train went to Boston. Oh, the train went all the way to Boston. Boston, yes. It stopped at Boston. Then, of course, when it got to there, I suppose they changed them to New York routes and, and northern routes, you yeah, know? Yeah. That's, that's, that's what those baggage cars were, because the baggage cars on a six-car train, uh, there was always two baggage cars. Did they ever, they didn't do fish that way. The fish always went by water, don't you well, suppose? Well, not all the time. They could went on Sometimes the, it went on the... Uh, on I know, the, on the Fall River uh, boat. On the, on the Fall River boat, yeah, yeah but on the... Uh, on the, on the train, they'd have a few barrels to go up. That's if the catch was early in the morning. They'd ice that in the burlap with the sugar barrels and burlap with it on the top. 
Now, let's go back to ice. I think the ice is very interesting. Do you have any memories of the ice being delivered in your part of town? Oh, yes. I remember the ice being delivered because uh, we'd, uh, uh, the, ice, uh, the ice wagons had a little slant. And they had a tailgate and a small tailgate because they'd have to come up instead of pulling the ice all the time. They removed the tailgate and the ice would come down. And a lot of times the ice would would break and of course he wouldn't pick that up so everybody ran in and got the ice and took it in the house. Or, or sucked it around the straw right out in the street because you did suck it right then with the straw all over it. Well we would wipe that off but no the straw was uh, the, the straw was wiped off before it come down that was washed down the, in other words the wagon there was no straw in the ice on the wagon. Really clean? Clean it was washed down yeah the only thing we had to do was because the streets we didn't have paved streets then we had dirt and we had to take them home and, and wash the ice off. And then in our icebox, uh, what's the icebox, we didn't call a refrigerator, we had a top lift and we put that right in there. And to top that off, we had another uh, a thing the ice man had on there, and he, he card in the window, and it said 25, 50, or 100. So if you had two ice boxes, you'd get, you'd get two 50 pound pieces, see? Otherwise, if you had just a small ice box, you'd get a 40-pound piece. And that's the way he knew how much to deliver. And the ice man, uh, he'd take that cake of ice and he'd put it over his shoulder with the, with the tongs. But on top of his shoulder, on top of his back, he always had a rubber mat tied around his neck. So the water would run down off his clothes and he'd take it right and put it in the ice box in the kitchen. And that was, that was 10, cents a, 10 cents a block for that and 20 cents for the next one, and uh, 50 cents for the, for the big one. And that lasted, very often it lasted the whole week. If your it ice all, box it, it, was it, cold it, enough and yeah. you didn't use well, any of the it, ice. Well, in winter time we didn't use the ice box because we didn't have much heat. And what we had outside of the uh, house uh, was the window, the kitchen window, we uh, had boxes built. And we put the meat and stuff in the boxes, in clothes, covered with the with wood or shingles, and then we'd have we'd have milk, and we'd have the milk in the bottles. We used to get milk in the bottles after a while, but uh, up until that, at that time, in these ice boxes was, was sort of a cooler, and when we got the milk uh, in the bottles, when we start getting the bottles, we got a quart two quart bottles. But when you wake up in the morning, there was about three inches of uh, milk up on the top of the the top of the bottles. And uh, then, uh, uh, picking this about milk, I'm right on the milk here, but uh, on the milk situation, I, that's another thing I did when I was a small child. Uh, I delivered, I had, I had Cary Street, and uh, Cary Street, and, uh, and uh, Webster Street, and Mr. Murphy, he was from Portsmouth, uh, Middletown rather, and he had uh, from Ogden Farm, and he used to drop the five-gallon can down to uh, the corner of Cary Street and another five-gallon can the corner of Webster Street. And in those days, we had the cans, the tin containers, which held a quart, a half-gallon, and a gallon. And I had a pad that I had to mark out what Mrs. Sullivan and Mrs. Murphy and the rest of them, Mrs. Sherman, got up at the corner of the, of the street. And it wasn't so bad when there wasn't snow on the ground. But when the snow was on the ground, I had to put that on a sleigh and tie it down with the two handles on the side of the milk cans. And I had a dipper, just as you say, a ladle that you take the soap, a soup out of a pan. And I'd have to, uh, I'd have to take and go in and get the can, walk into the yard and get the can. It was a half gallon. I'd have to fill that half gallon can up, and they had a cover on the top. And after I filled it up, put it down, and walk through the snow and put it on the back piazza. And I can remember one time I never had. Uh, any trouble, but uh, one time it was a, a blinding snowstorm, and I went up there, and Mrs. O'Neill lived up in Cary Street, and she was a widow, and she uh, she had already uh, gotten a quart of milk, and I spilled some of the milk, and I didn't put anything in because somebody else would be out there, and she complained to Mr. Murphy that on such a date that McPoland didn't return the milk, didn't fill his can up, and she wasn't going to pay him for that. And then Mr. Murphy asked me about it. I said, well, I don't know. I said, it could have happened. I said, with the blind and snowstorm. So, he said, so Mr. Murphy took 10 cents out of my pay. And I was getting 50 cents a week for that. 
for getting up in the morning, for driving two streets, Cary Street and Webster Street, two five-gallon cans of milk. Before going to school? Before going to school. That milk had to be out early. I was up at 6 o'clock, you know, and that milk was down there. He must have been there at 5 o'clock and left nobody steal the milk, you know? So that's what we went into. And, uh, uh, there was no distribution at that time of butter at the same time and eggs. Just This was just the milk route. Well, I'm talking the milk route. I wasn't talking about that. Uh, he had eggs too, but he didn't have butter. But we had, uh, we had butter, speaking about that, we had butter in the tubs with the tubs and the lard and the cheese, all in, in big pieces. You'd have to cut them. It wasn't packaged deal at that time. But uh, that, speaking about the milk, that was the, my event of the milk that I, uh, that I was delivered for that amount of money. Now, you have you told me that you have clean sidewalks and you have delivered milk. Uh, did you ever deliver newspapers? Yes. I had from Pelham Street, speaking about newspapers, I delivered them. I had from Pelham Street uh, uh, to uh, uh, down to Cary Street. I delivered the daily news. And we had to go up there after school and get them. Nobody dropped the papers down like they do today. You had to go to the, uh, the paper store to get them in order to get the papers. And you'd have to sort them down. And uh, I can remember when I started out, when I first started out, that, uh, <coughs> crap on me, uh, Gratz and Moy had what they called a the mahogany bar. And uh, I'd like to go into the mahogany bar for cra because on the bar was on the right-hand side as you went in. and the left-hand side, there was a free lunch. There was salami and bologna and cheese and everything. And uh, Mr. Malloy said to me, all right, he says, give me my paper. He says, grab a piece and go out that side door. You know, we'll let you stay in the bar room. So you take and get a couple of pieces of rye bread and a couple of pieces of salami and throw it in, and you go out and, and you sit all the bar room. Before you got home, you'd have a free lunch because there's always a free lunch in the bar room. So I had that, but I had an awful time collecting money. I had, I had people that wouldn't pay me for the night, but they'd come back for a week. Then I'd have to go back and collect Saturday morning, and they said, I haven't got any money now, come back next week. Then I'd have to pay for that out of my own pocket. See? So that cost me money, and then we only made a penny on a paper, a penny on a paper, and I made, I carried, I must have had carried 75 or 80 papers, and I had a big room, and I had two bags, you know, and especially on the rainy day, that was a, a tough thing, you know, you had to keep those papers covered, because if you didn't, people wouldn't pay you, so you had to have a piece of rubber or a cloth to keep your papers dry. And so, then I suppose they wanted the papers right up at the door, too. Oh, yes. They're not on the piers. and not thrown on the piers. and not today. No, no. Today you throw them on the piers and you hope it isn't raining out. You know, or the dog takes it away or the wind blows it apart. So that'll, uh, that'll take care of that on the paper roll. Uh, this money that you made, uh, did any of it go to the family or was it for your own spending money? No. Uh, whatever you made... My mother divided that and she gave me some. And speaking about the money, I, 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 I Saturday morning, uh, uh, we'd, uh, we'd go junking. I'll give you a rough example. Saturday morning, we'd go junking after I chopped the wood and sifted the coal, got the ashes away, and put the ashes in the walkway. We had no concrete, no concrete steps, uh, no concrete driveways then, and we had to use the ashes for the, for the walks. And, uh, I can remember my father coming down, and uh, he says, you picked the coke out of the driveway? I says, yep, I did. I did pick it. Uh, that's it. Morality. Morality. All right, we're going in now. Well, I'm just wondering how many other wonderful projects you were doing, besides working for your family with the cinders, and did you have to shake down the furnace? We didn't have a furnace. Those ashes we were from a, the fireplace? That was from the from the black kitchen stove with the uh, uh, nickel trim on it. And that was from the parlor stove. We never had anything like that. And speaking about that, to get the cinders from that, and we didn't have any any radiation or any heat in the house. The only thing we'd do when you go to bed, you'd have the kitchen stove and the doors would be open between the rooms. And when you go to bed, uh, mother would have bricks or, uh, or uh, earthstone bottles that she would heat in the oven before we went to bed. 
and she would wrap them in a towel and put them in a bed. And when we got ready to go to bed, we went to bed at nine o'clock. We weren't out till one or two o'clock in the morning. So we, the bed would be nice and warm with the, uh, with the towels wrapped in the bricks and all of that. But in the morning when she called you up to get in, in there, and she says, yeah, I'll be right up, you know, and you turn over. And she says, I ain't gonna call you again, you'll be late from school, for school. So she closed that, so you turn over, and of course during tossing during the night, you kick the towel off and you hit that cold jug or the brick and you got your fanny out of the bed. So that's, that's the way that goes. And that's, that's where the ashes came from. And speaking about the ashes, when my father came home, he asked me, as I said previous, he asked me if I picked the coke up, the cold. I said, yes, I picked the coal up. That means the, the black coal. The little pieces. Yeah, the black coal that would have to burn. And they have to pick that up. And I would get a coal hod. We had a coal hod. You remember the old-fashioned mm -hmm. coal hod that he'd get $20 for now <laughs> for the coal hod, for the antique coal hod. And uh, I, I'd get the three quarters or sometimes full with that coal. And, he, and he'd say to me, he says, look, after supper, he says, take the lantern, light it, go out there, and he says, it rained when I came in, and it showed all the coal up there. So I had to go out with the lantern and pick the coal up. Mm -hmm. So all the coal was uh, picked by hand, and that's what we had to do it. And, went, and to uh, substantiate that for the firewood, we had a box behind the stove, and that thing was about 18 inches high and, uh, and about 20, uh, 30 inches long, and we had to cut that for a 12-inch, chop the wood, and 12-inch. And to get the wood, well, we have to get the wood we used to go down to the, the beach, uh, down the shoreline, and after high tide, load that up with the wet wood and take and bring it home and dry it out alongside the fence. Then we'd have to chop that in between times. And you'd have to do that those chores before you could go anyplace else. And uh, on the chores that I got, as I stated, what I did on there, and Saturday mornings, we'd, uh, after we did our chores, we'd go junkin'. And we'd pick up old rope and old bones, and at that time they weren't known as uh, as, uh, as winos. The fellows that drank, they had Jamaica ginger, and they used to drink the Jamaica ginger, and and then they'd throw the bottles away. So we followed followed these men around, and after they get through with the bottles, we'd pick the bottles up, and we got two cents a piece for the Jamaica ginger bottles, and we take it to the junk man. And a junk man was just down, a Smith had a junk store down on uh, Clinton Street, down right at Wellington Park. And we'd just sell the, the rope, then the bones and the old clothes and so forth, what we had, and we'd get 20 cents. We'd come home and mother say, well, what did you have? What did you do? How'd you make out today? I let's say 20 cents, you know? All right, she'd take it, she says, I'll take this, she says, nickel for the bijou and a nickel for the jawbreakers in the house at five o'clock. And that was your Saturday? That was a Saturday, and then of course we had a we know not not as a living room now we know it as a parlor, and you can go into that parlor only Friday night. See that was for guests. The minister. Well, minister, the priest, or whoever come in, you're five o'clock uh, uh, in the parlor. That's the place where you go for one one day Friday night. You did your homework at the kitchen table, and I had a, a kitchen table, and we didn't have any any electricity. And uh, we did it under lights. I had an old-fashioned uh, a light with a green shade, about 14 inches, and uh, at a kerosene lamp. And I, then the other job I had to do was clean the lamp chimneys with newspaper and fill the kerosene lamps and trim the wicks to so make sure everything was good. So that, that there is answering my question about what I did. Do you want to know some more? Sure, All right. sure. So we'll go and... Uh, Along. And then, of course, when I was down there, I uh, I went to uh, to uh, these private places. Well, previous to that, when I was down there, I worked for a company in New York City up in Bellevue Avenue, and uh, uh, known as John Patterson and Company, and they were catering to uh, uh, the the footmen and the coachmen and the butlers and the second men at these private houses on private estates. And my job was to uh, was to deliver clothes to these people after they got them repaired and pressed. And I had a bicycle, and I had uh, a basket on each side, a rack on each side of the basket, a basket in the front, a basket on the stern. And I started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and from 8 o'clock in the morning until uh, 
until uh, six o'clock at night. I got two dollars and fifty cents for delivery. But that was another thing. When I get home for supper, uh, mother wanted to know if I wanted something to eat. And I told her I couldn't eat. I had too much to eat because you'd go in the you'd go in the kitchen to deliver the uh, the merchandise to the uh, to the people in the kitchen. They'd have to go through the kitchen, and of course the cooks. Uh, were always there and they always gave you something to eat. I can remember at, uh, uh, Rice, uh, uh, Dr. Rice, he had a place in Miramar down the avenue. And uh, I got friendly with this, uh, with this German cook, there was a big German cook there. And what I liked about it, I have often told my wife about how good it is. Uh, right at the present time, I, you take the meat and you're not the marrow in the bone, mm. the marrow in the bone. Well, she used to take it, she had a lot of bones. And she gave me a rye bread, butter the rye bread, and she put that marrow in there and put some salt and pepper on that and give me a big glass of milk. And that was something. Every time I come there, she'd always have a marrow sandwich for me, you know. Maybe I'd, I'd deliver every second week, you know, and, and things like that. But all those private states all around, all the way down Bellevue Avenue, Cliff Walk, and, and around the Ocean Drive, I delivered on a bicycle for $2 and a half a week from 8 o'clock until 6 o'clock at night. So that... That takes care of that thing, and then another thing. I uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the beach. I worked on the Newport Beach. I made clam fritters down there, and they go at eight o'clock till six at night for a dollar a day making clam fritters. And then after you got through making the clam fritters, you'd have to scour all the pans. And we didn't have any SOS pads at that time, and we had to do it with with the soap and scrub brushes to clean the pans. And at that time, uh, people used to come down from Providence and the convention hall on the beach. Uh, uh, you could buy a pitcher of coffee and six clam cakes for 35 cents. Was and that in the restaurant that was there? No, that was a, what they call a convention hall. The convention We hall. never had a restaurant down the beach. But down the beach, we had the, we had the dance hall where Rudy Valley and all the big uh, bands started. And that's, that was the uh, Newport Beach here. Uh, along the boardwalk, there were some places that you could buy some kinds of food, were well, there yes, not? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The but convention hall, you can buy the sandwiches and stuff and soda and sandwiches and, and hot dogs in the, uh, in the uh, convention hall and along the stands on the beach. And clam cakes was your fort. That is what you really were good at. Well, clam cakes were all right because I didn't make them. Uh, my job was to dunk them. Uh, Mr. Gifford made the clam cakes, and they were all ready to dump in when the grease got hot, the oil got hot. I'd dump them and make sure the strainer was in there, and I'd dump them out, and then they'd put them in the sort of a, they didn't have a microwave oven at the time, they had a hot oven, and they put them in that hot oven, and uh, uh, delivered them. They were hot when you got the pitcher of coffee and the uh, six clam cakes for 35 cents. To go back a minute, you said, um, uh, when you uh, gave your mother the 20 cents, she'd give you back the, the nickel for the bijou. Explained what the bijou was. Well, she'd give me the, she'd give me the knife. I had 20 cents in my hand. And she gave me, uh, uh, she says, here, I'll take this dime. And she says, there's five cents for the bijou and a nickel for jawbreakers. And on the way up, there was a candy store. And these jawbreakers, you'd get four, four jawbreakers for a nickel. And that'll last you all afternoon because they were chewing and you'd be pulling them out of your teeth. And then uh, the Bijou was a show. And they used to have a piano player in there. We'd put in and we'd, the place would get loaded and the piano player would come down and she'd get a big hand coming down and everybody hooting, hooting. And then finally the cinema come on the screen. But at that time there was no uh, no sound. That was, uh, was a dummy picture. So you'd have to visualize, you know? And everything went through and everything else, yeah, and, and uh, this thing here, I'll tell you, that one of the things uh, was the Pearls of Pauline. That was, a, that was a picture that we saw there. And another thing we used to see there was Eddie Polo and Tom Mix and all the cowboy pictures. And they'd only have one show in the afternoon for matinee for the children. And that was five cents that for was the five whole cents afternoon. That was five cents for the afternoon, from two until four. That was a two hour show for five cents. And then you had to be in the house by five o'clock. And that's where all the things went. And then there was another show in town. We had the Colonial Theater, too. But the Colonial Theater was for vaudeville, and it was high price, so we couldn't go in that because they had a vaudeville, and then we had the Newport Opera House. And we only, mother and dad used to take us to that. 
A big treat. A big treat to go there. And then, of course, we had, the, uh, we had the other one here in the opera house. They had first, second, and the uh, third floor. I wouldn't say what, what we call the third floor, but uh, it's out of the question now, you know. But uh, you have to visualize what we call the third floor. <laughs> According to ethics, I can't say it. But uh, outside of that, we enjoy that. The, um, the children really uh, got an awful lot for their money in those days. What other uh, games did you play um, other than uh, going to the Bijou in a, in a crowd? I'm sure you went uh, traipsing down Thames Street all together in a crowd to the, to the movies. But um, did you play street games? Oh, yes. We played street games and uh, all kinds of games that uh, uh, baseball and uh, called Wiki. Wiki, it's a, it's a sort of a thing you make a point on through things and you add a stick and you hit it. And if you hit it up in the air, you got to hit like a baseball and go so many, get so many points. And then uh, uh, we had, uh, uh, we played street hockey. You know, in the winter time, we, had a, we didn't have any ice, but we on the streets, we'd play the hockey and raise the dust, and everybody in the house would come off that my curtains are getting dirty. So we'd have to knock off on that. And uh, uh, swimming, we did a lot of swimming. And of course, uh, down they, here at the Wellington. Yes, and of course, uh, they're oh. talking about today about the uh, sanitation of the pollution of water. But when we, we used to go down to King Park, and then Stone Pier is protruding out from the other side of King Park near the Idle Lose Yacht Club. And we used to dive off the, off that pier, and uh, there was no sanitation. We always ran into something, and uh, we didn't mind that. Nobody got sick or anything, but the pollution. But now they took taken now was of what they uh, what they've gone ahead and done. Now is a pollution to clear the bay, but that's still to never be because there's so many boats in this harbor, and and the fleet comes in here. And they're not supposed to discharge until they get out to sea. And it's still to it. That one. You set? All set. This one's set. Um, I think maybe um, we have almost finished. Uh, you never have told me anything about your sister, what part she played in this uh early childhood of yours. Were they girls and boys together um, oh, yes. playing from the yeah, school? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And these were all friends of yours from school. I suppose you didn't really know anyone that wasn't in school with you. No, you knew everyone from the grades up from the first grade up to the other grades, yeah. But you didn't keep in touch with the Carey school children after you went to St. Augustine. Oh, yeah, because they were in the neighborhood, the same neighborhood. You know, we knew what they were. Some went to proper school and the others went to carry school. And they and they all played together? They all played on, together, on, sure. There was no uh, no uh, no separation whatsoever. How yeah. about the families? Were the families friendly? Oh yes, everybody was, was friendly. friendly. Yeah. The only trouble is that uh, the mother had come over that Johnny kicked Frankie and uh, and uh, I pulled uh, Helen Johnson's hair and I, I shouldn't have done it. And <laughs> then my father hit me aside the face for doing it and then that's all right and as long as Mrs. Johnson saw that I got punished by hitting, for pulling her, her, her pigtails. She had long pigtails, and, and she sat in front of me in school, and uh, I always had the habit of uh, uh, attempting to pull her hair, and she's always howling, I'd always get in trouble. So between that and the principal, <laughs> you got me. Uh, were the sisters very strict at oh, St. Yeah. Augustine's? They were very strict, yes. Yeah, yeah, they were very strict, just like all of them. And, yeah, you had to add one sister there that, uh, uh, and, uh, incident I can remember that uh, we had the old-fashioned inkwells and we had three rows and uh, uh, I was sitting here and then another row was sitting here and then another row over there and Johnny Noonan was sitting on a other rail and then this other Anna Sullivan was sitting right here and I had the old-fashioned inkwell and I stuck the inkwell and I made a spitball and I stuck that in the inkwell and I waited for Anna to turn to look at a book and Johnny Noonan was looking at his book. He was upright like this. And I was waiting for Anna to go down to look at her book to see what she was reading. And I, when she went down, I took the ink, I took the pen and let it go. And Anna stood up. And the, the ink ball went down, the ink ball went down Anna's dress. And it cost my father $12.95 for, uh, uh, for a new dress. 
at that time, that's a new dress, <laughs> $12.95. Looking back, that same dress today would be about $45 or $50 for the same thing, dress for a girl. And then, of course, Sister Amadeus, she was down here, and she came over, and the rectory was right across the street. And then they had to pick up phones. It wasn't like they are now, you know. You had a dial. <laughs> and she called the rectory. And then after she called the rectory, she said, you ought to go over and see Father Rook. So she said, Father Rook know the whole story. So I went in there, and I, I didn't know whether I should go in the stone door or, or come out and sneak out. But I looked up and she, her mm -hmm. room, our room was facing the rectory. She came out, she's standing at the window with arms crossed. So I had a knock at the door and he opened the door. And he just come in and I noticed soon I got in the door and he let me have it right beside the face. He gave me an awful smack in the face. And he gave me a, a very bad scolding, and what are you going to do about it? So he said, your father knows about this. So, and out of consequences, my father had to pay $12.95 for the dress. And I don't believe that you tried spitballs in the inkwell again. No, that was the last time, because we, after that, we, uh, uh, the inkwells graduated. We didn't have that, the inkwells, you know? They changed the desks around, and we didn't have the, we didn't have the desks <laughs> at that time. But uh, uh, everything, uh, Everything else outside of that, and my schoolmates, I, I was always well, well liked with everybody. I had my time and everything else, and then uh, I can't say anything against them. We had our spats. The education was uh, different from what it would have been, what it is like today. Well, I think today that there's just. Uh, uh, we were very strict. We had to do our homework, but I don't think today they get enough homework to do in the schools right at the present time. Uh, I think it's uh, it should be, there should be more homework. There isn't enough homework being done at the present time. In other words, they're taking for granted uh, their uh, schoolwork right at the present time, and what they get in school, they think they're getting enough, but they're not. They're not getting enough. Did, have you any? Uh, did your children go to uh, parochial schools too? Yes. Could you compare? Do you think they got as good a foundation? Do you think this, the teachers were the same quality later on as they had been before? Well, I think uh, I think they were better because uh, in the parochial schools, that's my opinion. Because uh, uh, our, uh, our children uh, graduated in honors and from appropriate school, and uh, uh, my two daughters, they graduated from St. Catharines, and uh, uh, the two boys, they graduated from the LaSalle Academy, and uh, uh, my daughter was a nurse, she graduated from the Newport Hospital, she's a graduate nurse from the Newport Hospital, and my oldest daughter was a dental assistant throughout the city, and uh, my oldest boy, he graduated from Holy Cross, and the youngest boy, he graduated from PC, and he all come out with good honors. Wonderful. Yeah, I had a boy uh, from Holy Cross, he graduated from Kamaladi, and uh, and John, he's, uh, he's from Providence College, and he was on the honor roll, and he was charged of the upper book, him and another Newport boy, he was charged of the uh, book of Holy Cross from 1960. Oh, that's great. So that's, that's, You're that's, very that's proud of, of all of them. Right. But the child is on, I don't know whether I tell you that now, speaking about the children. Right at the present time, we've got 21 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. Are they all in the parochial school system? No. They're no. in some of them in the yes. public schools. Yeah, yeah, system. public schools now, yeah. And that, that makes it, uh, I'm here now, and uh, we've got them here, and, and they're all come along and then, and it's great to be with a wife after 58 years marriage and see the grandchildren and they were together after 58 years I don't know how she uh, how she put up with it but she's taken in there see so we can show that Mr. Sherman afterwards <laughs> yeah and, um, uh, and they get good on us you know so uh, we're proud of them you know we've had our tri we had our in and outs like anybody but still and all or one, one big click. Well, that, it's, yeah. that, it sounds like a lovely, it, just to take a look at you, looks like you, you've had a very happy life. Well. I think that goes without saying. Now, um, we haven't, um, I don't think that we'll go into uh, anything about uh, any more religion. I think as long as you uh, 
use the parochial schools. I think it's perfectly obvious that you have had special religious education and that you are interested. I do know that today uh, you are still interested. Uh, what was that? Uh, um, the Knights of Columbus oh, that's right. that was doing. We'll do that later on mm -hmm. because that will come into mm -hmm. uh, your civic and, and other mm -hmm. kinds of things. Uh, here is a question. Where did you meet your spouse? I met my spouse in, in Newport here. <laughs> and I wanted to meet her for, in the worst way, but the gang that I was going with didn't introduce me to it. It wouldn't introduce me to keep away. It was a year and a half before I, I kept drooling over now, her. Now, this was because she was in the other part of town. She was up in part of the town, and the upper part knew her, and they, I was downtown, and they kept me away from there. <laughs> now, you didn't tell me what her maiden name was. Her, her maiden name was Julia V. Curran. Curran. Yeah, that was an Irish name. C U R R E N. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> so, I mean, that. Uh, English? A. A. N. Yeah. A. N. <laughs> yeah. um, now, what about when your children were born? Um, we found out that you were up at Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, your children were born where? They're all in the Newport Hospital. All by Dr. Sullivan? Yes, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Sullivan, and my wife was born by Dr. Sullivan, too. My brother and sister were born by Dr. Sullivan, also. <laughs> um, when you brought up your children, uh, how much do you think you followed the way you had been brought up? Were you as strict? as you had been brought up. Yes, I would say in the in a in a verse not not as strict, you know, but I mean we we always kept them under tow, you know. We never got anything we we never had any trouble with them. That's one thing. We didn't have any trouble. But uh, they we've always been strict to it, Mother Sure, find where they were and who the company were and everything else. In order to keep them quiet while we were going to there we put a basketball court up in the backyard. And Mr. Seabury was living next door to us and speaking about curtains again. And if they, if the ball went over to her, friend, she'd get the ball and hold it for a while. And then she'd come out, and then she'd come out, she'd get me, she'd get me pulling. She says, I don't mind those boys there. She says, but I counted the other day, she said, the boys between Rogers and, and Della Stella were in their backyard. She says, I counted 35. She says, I want you to come into the house. So she took me into the house and we went through the kitchen door and she says, she raised the curtain. She says, look at this. I just washed these curtains last week. Now look at the dust out here. She had the windows open, no screens, and the dust was in there, so I got that from the screen. So I had a wire, I had a water the ground to keep them done. They didn't mind. But after I watered the ground and they played baseball, uh, basketball, uh, that ground dried up pretty quick. And of course, what mother, mud was left, on that, it came into our house because they wanted to drink the water. So we had to watch the kitchen floor. So that's the. <laughs> but at least you, they were under you, and you knew what they were we doing. We knew where they were at all times. We now, what about Cardine Field? When did they start playing there? Well, we we didn't stop playing there because they. Uh, Freebody uh, Park, I guess. Yeah, Freebody Park. They played football there. The boys played football there. Yeah. They played football and basketball. That's what the, my two boys played, and of course the girls played, and then they were in plays, the girls were in plays, as girls would be, and they had a great time, you know. Now, they uh, they finished uh, St. Uh, Catherine's and uh, De La Salle uh, before 1950-something, uh, didn't they? Oh, yes, they? yes, yes. In the, yeah, in the yeah, early yeah, 50s. That's right, yeah. So they didn't... Yeah, they went there. Uh, 50, uh, Early 50s, yeah, 50, middle 50s, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah They're about the same age as, as my children. I, I I like to keep it all, yeah, yeah. Uh, all together. Um, now, I think you told me the other day that you moved from Cary Street up to Bull Street. No, no. We we went get uh, from where it says when I got married. We, uh, I moved from there. We moved up to uh, uh, 
of uh, Marlborough Street. Uh, Marlborough Street. Marlborough and Thames Street, yes. Uh, not where the saloon was. No, no. Have you seen what they've done with that? Yes. It's beautiful what they've done there. But we'll talk well, about talking, that to reconstruction. You're talking about, the, uh, you're talking about my house uh, up there, as you said, Billy Good's place. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we were down the other corner. Oh, the other corner. We were right. down on Thames Street. Right. That's we, on the corner of uh, West Broadway in this one. Oh, I see. see? I see. Thames Street. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about redevelopment, so we won't discuss that now. So you were down at Marlborough Street, and how long did you stay there? Uh, three years, two years. Yeah, you know, two years there, and we moved from there. We moved from uh, there up to Farewell Street. To Farewell Street. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you had another move. Yeah. And was that out Farewell? No, uh, right across from the graveyard. There, right, right, right as you come from Broadway. Yeah. Yeah, 33. Yeah, 33. 33. And Farewell. then you had some children along the way in each one of these places. Yeah. 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 And then when did you go to Bull Street? There were uh, 33. Uh, 33 and we'll both And we're, you stayed there until 80? Until we got now, we were there for 50 years. 50 years yeah. on Bull Street. Yeah, that's right. Um, when you were at these other places like Marlborough and uh, Farewell, I suppose there wasn't very much uh, neighborhood feeling then. Did you get into the neighborhood? There wasn't much neighborhood there, well, it was, was neighborhood, there? But we uh, were uh, friendly with everybody. Everybody was friendly. Yeah, we had a mixture with Syrians and Irish and Italians and everything. Well, now did you have to go to St. Joseph's yes, Church? Yes, we went to St. Joseph's Church. Yeah, yeah, we went to St. Joseph's Church. Yeah. She was baptized and we were married in St. Joseph's Church in 1926. Yeah. Um, have you got anything particular uh, that would be nice to, to know about either the Marlborough Street time or the Farewell Street time? Well, and the where were you work? We we haven't found out now. You have, after you got married, you had to do more than uh, deliver uh, milk and and uh, that's right. Follow the ice wagon. Yeah. So what were you doing then, when you were married? Well, when I got married, I was working for O'Connell, J. T. O'Connell. I started with J. T. O'Connell in 1920, in April 1920, and I worked for J. T. O'Connell from 1920 until 1961. So that's a period of 40 years and six months, and that's a long time. And you started at the bottom, I suppose, I before you got up to the top. I started scratch. When I started in 1920, there was only five of us there. 1924, there was only 12. And after that, 1927, there was 15. And that was the first store down on Long Wharf? It's Wharf? always been there, Long yes. Wharf. Yeah. And then uh, in 1925 and 1926, I, he made me manager of the Jamestown store. He bought a Jamestown store, and I had to go across the Jamestown ferry every morning and come home at night every on the Jamestown ferry. This was before you got married, or while no, you were a groom? We were married. You were married. You were married. That's right. And then I uh, stayed here and I with JT until the, uh, on the wharf here until the, uh, 1948. I had charge of the Marine Division here, a Marine Hardware and so forth. So that was up Tim. That was no, down Tim no, Street. No, no, no. Still on the wharf. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, that was the old thing. They didn't have the Thames Street store then. So I, uh, I was there, and then of course he sent me to Providence in 1948 to help him clean up. There was a little miss up there, so I had to go up there, and instead of him there. He kept me there, and I, he made me manager there in 1942. I had, uh, 1952 rather, and I had uh, 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 27 men under me. And I had to commute every day from there in the morning and come home at night. And on the way down, I had to deliver, deliver supplies in the car to the boat yards on the way down. And sometimes I didn't get home till half past seven, a quarter of eight, and what steak or meat she had, she always had to heat it for me. And then she always was on my back for coming down so late. Why was so late? And I had to do that for the business, being for the good of the of the uh, business. See, but that didn't do anything good to me. So when I uh, come along here, and he bought another company, he bought the combination ladder company in Providence, and <clears throat> they manufactured ladders, uh, ladders, and and so fire equipment, extinguishers, and so forth. So he made manager of that. I had two under my domain at that time, and. Uh, of course, in 19, uh, 1961, I, got, uh, I started to get a wrong deal. I heard through the grapevine what was going to happen to me and the managers of the other stores and the people that were in there. So 
I beat him to it. <laughs> and I uh, I told him that I'm out. You know, after you, 40 years. You got I, retirement, though. No, ma'am. I know He had no retirement, no pension. I worked for him for 40 years and six months without any pension. When did he die? I've forgotten well, now. Well, I forget what guy is. He must have been dead about eight years now. More than that, yeah, I think. Well, yeah, or long, yeah, longer than yeah. that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I just don't believe he cried and I cried. <coughs> yeah, well, that's a long time to uh Yes, to but break no up. pension in there. And then uh, when I came back here and uh, I told Mom what I did, and... Uh, she cried. She cried, too. Because <laughs> all of these times with him and, of course, met Mr. O'Connell and Mrs. O'Connell, and it meant something to her, you know? And I was the only one, when I was employed by O'Connell down here, I was the only one home at Sundays if they came looking for, for some merchandise. Nobody else was home, and I'd always been the sucker to go down and get the merchandise, and I didn't get any thanks for it, you know? And she didn't like that. She got... Yeah, well, I had the key to get in. Yeah, I have to. And and uh, but I took care of the plumbers and the steam fitters. And I, I can imagine Mrs. Norman, uh, my uh, up and up near Red Cross Avenue. And Frank Pinkham was the plumber. And he called me up and wanted to know if I'd come down at two o'clock in the morning, get on some elbows and sees that the boiler and the pipes let go up in that big estate up there. So I said, well, I can't. I said, my wife is in the hospital having a baby, and I said, uh, I uh, I can't come down. And my old daughter at that time, she said, Dad, I'm awake. She said, I'll stay awake until you come back. So he came up to the car, and I went down and got him the uh, uh, the fittings that he needed in there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then I got, at quarter past 6, I got another call. He was short of nipples. So I had to go down and get a nipple for him to take that in. So he thanked me very much. And, he gave me five dollars, so that was it. And he thanked me very much for the uh, for the services in the time of need. So that's one of the cases. And then in March, uh, the doorbell rang, and, and Mrs. McPoland went to the door, and she said that this gentleman wants to see you. And uh, I went out there, and he said, "Mr. McPoland," he said, "I'm Mrs. Norman's secretary," and. Uh, he says, you did a wonderful thing, and Mrs. Norman appreciates what you did, and she says, here's a letter with something in it. And I thanked her very much, and she says, Mrs. Norman, thank you. When I opened it up, she said, a nice letter, thanking the service that I did in a time of need for, for Mr. Pinkham to, to put her boiler so the rest of the house wouldn't freeze, the radiation in the house wouldn't freeze, and she gave me $20. She was a lovely woman. She I knew was. her. Yeah, yeah. Yes. so that was something there. Yeah. So that's, that's my... My story yes, on that on one. On that one, yes. So, that, that, that's, that, so that. when I when I came down uh, after that, I uh, after I quit JT, I uh, I went uh, driving cab, and I drove cab for three and a half years, the cozy cab. Was it fun? Oh yes. It yeah. was fun. I wasn't left it? her home at six o'clock at night, and didn't come back till six o'clock in the morning. She was on the home all alone at that time. They, yeah, <laughs> nobody was home, you know, and I, I have to drive around and see that everything is all right, you know, when I was at, like at Goldman Avenue, I'd come down through Bull Street to see if the house was all right and nobody breaking in and everything like that. And I, uh, I put it in there, so getting at the cab, as I drove the cab, I, uh, I come down and had an argument one day with the, one of the bosses, and they says, well, I says, I don't like the deal that you're giving me, you know. And so I was trying to get for driving like a a, a, van, a, a, a big car. For, you get ten dollars for driving that van for a funeral, you know, for a big car for a Cadillac, and uh, or, uh, for, or a Buick or something like that for driving it. And I didn't like it because there's a fellow came after me and they gave it to him to drive it, and I told him where to go. So I came down and I says I was going home. I had an argument with him. He says he said what are you going to do now? I says. Well, I said, I'm going to California to see my son out in California, my sister. And I came home, and that's about 10 minutes to 7. And I left at 6 o'clock. And I came back, and I threw my hat on the table, and my change purse and everything. And my wife says, what's the matter? I said, I had it with the boss. And I said, I'm going to the, uh, I quit my job. 
And I says, we're going to California and see my sister May and my son Roy out in San Jose. And uh, he says, how are you going to do that? And of course, we didn't have any money and uh, put it in there. So I was in there and I got something to eat in there. And, it's, and then I had to go to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom and while I was in the bathroom, she called up to the daughter and she said, Kitty, she said, that's the girl you met here. She says, Kitty, your father's gone nuts. He threw his job up in the taxi cab business and he's going to California <laughs> and we and and we haven't got any money. She says, I don't know what's the matter with him. We might have to put him away. And that's what she said. <laughs> so that's what she, she said. So she she had to call my daughter and tell me about it. She couldn't wait. <laughs> so finally we... Uh, we uh, finally uh, managed to get together anyway, and uh, uh, we went out and, and, of course, previous to that, the boss said, look, it after you come back from California, it's just your job is still open. I said, okay. So that was it. So we went to California. We were out there for five and a half weeks. But uh, uh, California, they can keep California. I'd rather wear Long John's in the New England states here than the California because it was chilly in the morning, and it's getting chilly in the afternoon because we were in the valley, we were in the San Jose. So, I mean, that was our final contact. Is that so, any, any questions? So you, you well, you came back uh, and uh, didn't do very much. Did you still do more cab driving for some more years? Well, I just for a, just a few months. A few more months. Yeah, and then I got a job at uh, Williams and Manchester Shipyard. They told me they wanted somebody there, and I went down there, and I, I worked down there for eight years. Uh, did charge of the purchasing and the billing of supplies for the boats. And when I came of, uh, of, uh, became of age, or 70 years of age, and uh, I didn't know, but uh, they had $35,000 insurance on me. Isn't that And great? now I could stay if I wanted. And Mr. Rockland, he was the owner of the business with uh, Arthur Manchester at the time, but he was the, he's the uh, predominating stockholder. And I could get along with him very well. And uh, he's, uh, he was very good to me, and I'd have to consider the matters with him. If it was okay with him, I was okay. This one time I went in there and we needed some bolts and stuff, and I made a, a list of bolts up, and uh, I told him we need this for stock to have it. I said, you can't operate a shipyard like this without any stock. So I turned to the list. He says, you haven't got a figure on there, boy. I said, well, I said, this is pretty near. Uh, I said it was eight or nine thousand dollars. He said that's a lot of money. He says could you break it down? So I got it down. It was uh, five hundred dollars less than ten thousand dollars. And he says you sure you need this? He says I'll take it home and study it. He came in the next morning and he says Roy. He says uh, uh, he says that's a big order. He says you got a good discount. He says if you give the whole order, do you think you could get an extra discount? So I says I tell you Dave, I'll see what I can do for you. And I called up my friend and I told him what I got. I said, this whole order is yours. I said, if you give me a 10% extra. He said, you got the 10% extra. So I said, I'll call you back in an hour. So I called him back in an hour and I gave him the order for that. But that's how a, a man that you could talk to. Yeah. Uh, and he's a very understanding gentleman. And uh, uh, as I said previous, they had $35,000 insurance on me. And I could keep at the job and stay there if I take the insurance. But at a hundred dollars a week, I couldn't. I couldn't cover it. That thirty-five thousand. So I got off. But then, what I found out afterwards, I uh, I was wondering where the things came after I get a pension from there. We got to, uh, <laughs> one new time I was out wandering around. One new time I came home and after I got my social security. And Mrs. McFarland says she got a big check from the Social Security, five thousand three hundred and forty dollars. She says, "What are we going to do with that?" I said, "I don't know on that thing." I says, "We got to look into this." She says, "We can't spend it." I said, "No, we're not going to spend it." I says, "We'll put it in the bank." So we took and put that money in the bank, and three weeks later, there was another check came in for thirty-five hundred from the Social Security, and we put that in the bank. And then finally, after about three or four weeks after that, we got a notice from the head Social Security that there was a mistake. Now, if we had taken that money and spent that money, 
So we put it in the bank and we got the interest on that money. So we made a check out. We returned that to the Social Security. How did they make that mistake, do you suppose? Well, I don't know. But we had the money in the bank and we made about $250 on the deal anyway. And and they got the, uh, they got the money back and we didn't cost us anything. But we, on the working, we got straightened out afterwards. But that was an error on somebody's part. But that's that's the whole whole story on that part. So that's that's another incident. <laughs> well, you're and thoroughly uh, retired now. You're just yeah. having fun. Well, another thing. Well, we haven't had fun because <laughs> at our age we can't have too much fun. And another thing, uh, I was called in on the fire department. Well, then we're going to talk about that oh, differently. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about that right. as a separate thing. That's right. Because yeah. that's going to be very interesting. Yeah. So that's uh, that's about all that I can say. Uh, uh, Anything else you want to say, um, Miss I think that we've gotten, uh, the, the, the last item here is uh, what you have done in the way of civic organizations, and um, I think that we'll probably cover that when we get uh, next time, when we get on these specific uh, things. Um, the last question is, uh, how do you feel about living in Newport? You've already told me. You wouldn't give anything for living in Newport. That's right. California can just go. Um, there was something about, though, have you ever gotten mixed up in any kind of political uh, groups? Have you done any politics? Yes, I'm a, I'm a Democrat. Oh, I mean, have you uh, I'm a active? Democrat, yeah, have and you I, active? I was chairman. I was in the city council in 1950 to 1952, and they gave me the job that I didn't like, chairman of the police and fire department. And I had a tough time. They wore my rug out and my steps looking for a job, and at that time I didn't get any money. I was a good, gifted citizen, and everybody was looking for me and looking for Roy. And they'd say, where is Roy? And she, my wife would tell him that he's over in the prison over across the street, the city hall, because we had night meetings and Sunday meetings and everything else at the city hall. But of course you were the perfect person to do it. Yeah, but I had a tough time. I fighting one another. It's just like they're doing right at the present time, like this parking ticket that got there, which is going to be a disgrace. Who's going to enforce this? And when I was in the council, I would tell you about this time here, uh, I went down to Philadelphia Navy Yard to look for some surplus material they had there, and I got wandering around, and I came along this fellow sitting in a chair, and he looked at me, and he says, hey, you that tag. He says, you shouldn't be in this part of the yard. I said, what's the matter with it? And he says, well, he says, uh, he says, this is a restricted area. I says, what are you doing here? He says, I'm watching this fire apparatus. I says, where's the rest of the men? He says, no men here, only me. They come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I get relieved at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I says, what are you doing? He says, he's watching the apparatus. And he, I says, well, I said, this. I says, well, he says, this is surplus. So I pulled my badge out. I had my fire badge and showed him. He says, come in, I'll show it to you. So he took me in and showed me. He started the engines up. There's three engines in there, 1,000 gallon American LaFrance pumps, only less than a year old. And they were declared surplus. I said, who do I see about this? He said, well, he says, you go and see Lieutenant Hurahan at Building 56 in the Navy Yard. That's over in the other far corner of the Navy Yard and talked to him. I went over and waited for a half an hour and I saw that Mr. Hurahan had a good talk with him and told him that I was a member of the fire department and I was on the city council. And he said, Mr. McFoley, he says, these pieces of apparatus can be bought, the three of them, they're less than a year old for $22,500. What would the city have been willing to pay? No, I came back and put it in there, and what do you think? They turned me down, thumbs down. Two months later, you know what they did? They voted me out, and they bought an apparatus for 27500 for one piece, and it was a piece of junk. <laughs> I know that you've been working uh, recently for the... Um Knights of Columbus, was that some special deal, or have you been active in Knights of Columbus all your life? Oh, well, I'll tell you that uh, Knights of Columbus, and uh, I went into Knights of Columbus, and, uh, and uh, I joined the Newport Council number 256 in uh, April of 1924. Uh, 
That's a good long time ago. So, in other words, uh, right at the present time, I'm uh, an honorary member of the Knights of Columbus. I'm the second oldest member of this council now, uh, with the 60 years in this uh, council. And uh, I've enjoyed every every moment of this council, and the fellows, and, the, and I had meetings with them, and I served on the different committees. And uh, I, uh, I was on the degree teams in uh, quite a, year, a few years, and I was away from home. We'd go away for to put on these degrees on a Friday night, and sometimes I'd never come home till 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And uh, Mrs. McFarland was a widow again, and everybody looking for me, she says, well, she says, I'm a Knights of Columbus widow. She says, my husband isn't here, but I'll tell him you called when he came in. And uh, the group went along, and then in 1948, they were looking for a financial secretary, and uh, who was chosen financial secretary but Roy McFarland. And I had that job from 19, uh, all during the year of 1948. At that time, we had that, we had 1,500 members that I had to take care of on the books. And this was a this was a <laughs> uh, a tough thing for me to do. And when I took this over, I uh, I had a lot of trouble. And uh, from the financial secretary, he did not enter the members' dues in the books, and uh, I wouldn't enter the na names in the books in the books that he was using. So I bought myself a ledger, and I put that down. And the Supreme Council of the Knights of Columbus sent. Uh, three representatives up here and told me that Mr. McFarlane, you can't do that. You have to continue in that book of the Knights of Columbus. And I told Mr. Hurley that they inspect one of the inspectors that was here at the time that I'm not going to enter anything in that book. I said, I have my book here. And I says, I'm entering the dues as they come. And he says, what do you do with the insurance members? I said, well, I have another book for the insurance members. I take their money in a day to pay the insurance down. And, uh, uh, they get credit for it, and I give my card. I give a membership card with a paid up dues. And he says, what do you do with the money? I said, I take the money and go to the bank with the insurance members and get a certified check and mail it to the Supreme Office in New Haven, Connecticut, to the insurance division with a, and with a letter with all the members that's paid up for that time. And uh, uh, I enjoy that very much. But I only had it for a year, but it was a lot of night work. And... Uh, I, I certainly look back at this to see how crazy I was to do this for this time. But uh, as for a year, uh, it started, and uh, I, uh, I gave it up after a year. Another young fella took it over, so I decided to, uh, to forward it to him. And he insisted that I continue, and I just happened to turn it down because it was too much, too much with my job working. And uh, then we got going along, and... Uh, of course, as I stated previous, we had 1,500 members. But then the council broke up. In other words, out of the 1,500 members, uh, the Borough Council started in Tiverton. In Tiverton, Rhode Island, they started the council. And the As I stated previous, that the uh, Middletown Council started out, and uh, of course that's the third council in the in this county in Newport County, and uh, uh, right at the present time, uh, with the diminution and the members dying off and the uh, younger generation moving out of towns to get better jobs, uh, right at the present time at the council we have uh, only uh, 450 paying members, and the Newport Council 256. Do you find it's hard to keep the young people interested? Yes, the young people don't attend the meetings. At the meetings before our council meetings, uh, we used to have anywhere from 75 to 100 at the meetings. But uh, today with the officers in there, we're lucky if we have 50. And uh, that uh, that's, makes it sad to see, looking back after the 60 years that I've been in this organization, to see, see what's happening to the younger generation. Of course, uh, the cycle's turned around and uh, Everybody is that uh, they don't want to leave the uh, TV and they don't want to leave the basketball games and they don't want to go to a dance or anything like that. They want to stay home and they can't devote the an hour and a half for a meeting at the club. 
So that's uh, uh, on that. And now you ask me about this here. You saw me up here selling Tootsie Rolls. And on its Tootsie Roll drive, uh, uh, we have the privilege here. We have we started uh, what they call a quarter century club. It was started in 1960 by a group of brothers who attained 25 years of knighthood in the Knights of Columbus. It was considered a special event that should be recognized by an annual get-together to, to enjoy the long association and relive pleasant memories. This year's annual dinner is very special, for we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. The committee would like to see at least 150 members of Quarter Century Club in attendance. And we are uh, sending this letter out to about 244 members, which were in the 1960s class as we started. So we don't know how we're going to proceed here. But I'll give you a background of what the Quarter Century Club is doing here. Uh, we, uh, we started here in the Tootsie Roll Drive four years ago. And the Tootsie Roll Drive is a thing that we go out and we have a, an apron and, and a hat with the Knights of Columbus on it. And the apron says, please help the retarded children. Uh, we uh, put the apron on and in the aprons they have pockets, two big pockets in the front. And uh, we load that up with Tootsie Rolls, which we buy. The Tootsie Rolls now, uh, days that, we, that we're giving out for the donation, are about five inches long. And uh, uh, they're about three quarters of an inch thick. And uh, uh, if a person gives us uh, a dime, we give them one Tootsie Roll. If a person gives you uh, 50 cents, we give them Tootsie Rolls, two Tootsie Rolls. Then they go along, and if somebody slips in a $5 bill in the container, we reach in the, in the pocket and give them a handful of Tootsie Rolls. And speaking about that, how people will notice what is going on. I was in front of Almax, in front of the Newport Creamery, and we had the can in front of me. And this fellow came along and he put 50 cents in the container, the sealed container. We just have a slot in the container. He put 50 cents in the container. And I gave him two Tootsie Rolls. And he stood over, moved to the side of the creamery, and started eating the Tootsie Rolls. And this friend of mine came along that just came from Florida. He says, Mac, how are you doing? I says, well, things are coming along good, Neil. I says, how are you doing? Are you retired yet? He says, yesterday I retired. And he says, wife and I just came back from Florida. And he says, boy, he says, you're doing this. You're, how many years are you doing, uh, doing this? I said, this is my fourth year. And he says, your age, where is the younger generation? So he said, he reached in his pocket, and he put down, he took the bills out, and he gave me two $5 bills, folded them, and stuck them into the container. I reached in my apron and gave him a handful of Tootsie Rolls. And I thanked him very much for the donation. After he left me, this fellow that was eating the Tootsie Rolls that gave me 50 cents, and he was eating the Tootsie Roll over there, came over to me, he says, hey, fella, he says, I bought some Tootsie Rolls from you, and uh, you gave me two Tootsie Rolls. I says, yes, but you put 50 cents in there. He says, yeah, but you gave him a, ha a whole handful of Tootsie Rolls. I says, why shouldn't I? I says, he put two $5 bills in that container. I says, you gave me 50 cents. I says, you're eating one Tootsie Roll. I says, I'll take 50 cents out of my own pocket. Give me one Tootsie Roll back, and, and I'll satisfy you. He says, damn you, and he walked away. And that's my story on the Tootsie Roll. And then we continue along on that. Now, on this drive, we have this drive, the Tootsie Roll drive. Uh, we have this uh, every year around April. And uh, we started on the, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 10 in the morning until 6 at night. And then, of course, after we go back, we have all that change in there. We have to count all our uh, returns and, and rewrap the money. And sometimes I didn't get home till 9 o'clock at night from half past 9 in the morning. And that's another time when I got, uh, got notice from my wife that it was out too long, keeping things waiting for me. But we enjoyed it very much. Uh, uh, this year, uh, we didn't do too well. Uh, we took in only took in one thousand six hundred and eighty dollars this year, oh, and, and a three day three day uh, uh, drive. And uh, last year we took in uh, uh, two thousand and fifty dollars. So we uh, depreciation this year because we didn't have enough help. We have a committee of twenty, and as you will know, Mrs. Chairman, that things if you're on the committee, there is always some sucker that look let Joe do it. 
And then, of course, we only had 12 out collecting, and that was for the deficiency in the Tootsie Roll amount of cash that we received. Now, all of this money uh, goes to the state council that we take in. It goes to the state council, and they gave it, give us any amount of money that we need for the share that we turned in, like we turned the $1,680 in, and we'd get credit for that. Now, uh, uh, this year we haven't done anything so far for a donation, uh, uh, but uh, last year, out of the fund, we, uh, uh, for the Maha Center, uh, we donated one wheelchair, we donated four pair of crutches, and, and eight pair of sneakers. Wow. So that was as the result of the, of the Brother Knights devoting their time for the help of retarded yeah. children of the city of Newport. That's now, true. this incident I told you about this man in the quarter, and the fellow gave me a uh, uh, two five dollar bill, that's right from my horse's mouth. I was the one that collected that, and I'm not afraid to put it down. So that's all I can tell you about that. Now, uh, this year, uh, we're having a, a 25th annual quarter century club dinner at the council home on Mill Street on Thursday, night, uh, Thursday evening, May the 24th, 1984, and the social hour will be from 6 to 7 p.m., and the dinner will be served at 7 p.m., and we have to have all our reservations in by the 21st, because if we don't have that in, we can't give the caterer and the exact mind, but still and all, with this here, they say they're coming, and they don't give us any money, and we just have to check them off that they're coming to the dinner, and there might be 10 that said they were coming and they did not show up. The cost of the reservation for this dinner is six dollars per person. So if ten members didn't show up, it's cost us sixty dollars that we have to take out of our kitty to reimburse that. So I think that with this weather coming up and the way the uh, uh, the returns and I'm uh, uh, I was designated to send the checks to uh, Roy P. McPaul in the 39 Harrison Avenue, and to date I got. Uh, I got uh, uh, 72 people oh, that's, that's all ready now to come in. If you, if yes. you get their checks, they're going to come. Well, if they get their checks, we don't mind that if they don't come. We, we, still got the, we still have the money to pay for that. So I think, Mr. Chairman, that this, this will give you my uh, thing on the Knights of Columbus, and I'd like to see uh, me be in the Knights of Columbus in another 15 years with God's help. Well, so I that's think my story of the night done a Columbus. wonderful, wonderful job, and I, I'm so glad to hear about the Tootsie Roll and that you've done that wonderful work, and I suppose in the years past also for the, for the retarded. You've yes. Done, done wonderful yes, we things. have that. In other words, we have a, uh, we have a clam bake out there for the retarded children out of the Kepner's uh, Clam Bake Club in Middletown, and uh, the, the fellows donate their time. And they cook the hot dogs and hamburgs and corn and give them a plate at five o'clock in the afternoon and they play games and, and you'd be surprised. And when I first started this, I thought uh, uh, that the children were retarded, that they were small retarded. But there's some of those people that are retarded that were children from years back and they're 25 and 35 years of age. Yes, that's and these the are saddest. things that you look in, that's the saddest part. That's and especially the saddest part is when you see the mother coming with a 35-year-old son and helping him along to, to eat a hamburger or, or a thing and, and put corn. It, it's, it's amazing. I, it brings tears to your eyes. And it certainly makes you thankful for having gotten through life It certainly does. I look like that, that way and I thank the Lord that, that we shouldn't have anything happen to us on that case. But that's my whole story, Mrs. Young. Well, that, that uh, I think, uh, is, is, a, is very interesting because I think that a lot of us have no idea uh, what various organizations like uh, the Knights of Columbus or the Masons or the Lions or the Rotarians, what they do, and I think it's 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 lovely to get that down on well, the Well, I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, well, it, it, not to interrupt you, but uh, uh, you're speaking the Lions and the Rotary and the, all the other clubs and all the churches, they all do their share to help the retarded. Uh, not speaking for myself as a member of the Knights of Columbus, but all uh, fraternal organizations, regardless of religion through the city, uh, a great help to the right. retarded. Yeah. Yes, and I appreciate that very much, and I've enjoyed their company too. Now, what we want to find out now is, uh, as a small boy, did World War I do anything to you? Were you particularly aware of it? Yes, World War I. And uh, uh, previous to World War I, uh, 
I don't know whether you you don't remember this, but uh, uh, we had uh, the start of World War One, say around uh, 19, 1915, 1916, there was trouble brewing on the other side. And then when the uh, when the bubble broke on the other side, uh, everybody was wary of what was going on. Uh, I can remember down at King Park at 19, uh, 19, the early part of 1916, where we went crabbing, and I, we saw this submarine coming into the harbor. And it anchored right across, right on the west side of the torpedo station, that is towards the Jamestown side. And there were three fellows in the rowboat, and it wasn't our numbered submarine, it was a German numbered submarine. And they rode out to the submarine, and uh, they talked to the captain on the submarine, and the captain gave them some letters to, to if they mailed, be kind enough to mail us some letters to them. So they say they, they would, and they asked him how long they're going to be here. He says, we're not going to be here long. He says, they're kind enough to, to get the letters, to mail the letters. So we gave them a pack of letters, and then they came back in, and while we were looking out there, the submarine pulled up the, the anchor and headed out to sea. And then, of course, uh, the next morning, the papers were filled with with all the uh, ships being uh, hit by torpedoes by the submarine that left Newport. And there was that, that, that just was off Nantucket Island. And there must have been about 10 or 15 freighters that were carrying supplies to the other side. And they were just coming this way to take the northern route because that nor northern route was the shortest to get to England. And they didn't hit any American boats, but they hit the, hit the British and the French. And that was all, the sinking was all the result of the, uh, of the submarine that came into Newport Harbor. You had told me that your mother had come from the other side. Did she become an American citizen? Oh, yes. Did she have any trouble the way some of the Germans, we had some German uh, names and background, and was there ever any trouble that you ever knew that anyone no. ever said you, to her that she was a German or No, or nothing? mother never had any trouble when she got her papers. Dad said that she got her papers and there was no trouble at all and that everything was taken care of and that she was an American citizen. Yeah? Uh, you're, you're, uh, nobody in your family had to serve in World War One. No, no, no. no, no. Um, and you being a, a, a boy in school That's right. didn't have any, uh, didn't really make that much difference to you other than that you knew that we were at that war. That we were at war. war. Now, let's, uh, let's skip the years and go on to, uh, by the time the Second World War came along, because um, it was just a repeat, there was the same war in Europe going on and everything, but by that time, our Navy installations here in, in Newport were pretty pretty great. Uh, did you have, uh, it must have affected you definitely in your work, World War II, yes. the we're, supplies. Uh, of World, the World War II, uh, when it first broke, and uh, in my capacity in the Marine Department, uh, J.T. O'Connell's, <coughs> uh, and I had the uh, I had the children, and I couldn't serve in the service. But uh, uh, getting ahead of that, I uh, I was in the service. I was in the Naval Reserves from 1920 till 1932, and uh, I got out of the service in 1932 because the children were small, and uh, I I had to do my tour of duty aboard the ships for two weeks tour of duty. And uh, I uh, I didn't serve, but getting back to World War II, uh, it was certainly hectic, with uh, the government picking all these stocks up and depleting the stocks, and we couldn't get the stock, and we had to get the, what they called a priority, it was known as a J10, and if you sold to the government uh, uh, so much material, they would give you a J10 to purchase that from a manufacturer if you could get it. But that J-10 was piled up so much and there was so much stuff going to the government that uh, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't compete with it. As a, as, a, as a matter of fact, we got stuff from the ships here and uh, the, uh, uh, at the naval base here and in the harbor, uh, we, we had about, uh, about eight battleships 
right in the harbor on the west side of Jamestown in the deep water. And that, that was a lot, and we supplied metal polish and rope and twines that they couldn't get from their storing rooms at the Navy base. And uh, uh, we kept going right along, and I can remember one time that uh, uh, Chief Boatswain's mate, supposed to be a friend of mine, he came over and they wanted to make a, a clothesline. And of course the Navy clothesline at the recruiting station where they trained the sailors is uh, on big telephone poles and they pull them up with block and tackle. They put their clothes on them, pull them block and tackle, and they're about 20 feet up in the air. They hoist them up. The fellows pull them up and let the clothes dry. And uh, uh, this fellow here, uh, uh, the way I came to know him, I, uh, he was out of Providence, out of East Providence. And uh, when I was getting, getting ahead of myself, when I came back uh, from uh, uh, in the Naval Reserves, I was on the uh, on the uh, U.S. ship, the battleship Utah. And that was in 1924. And uh, and who was on this battleship but uh, Taddei, Q.C. Taddei. And he was the chief boatswain's mate. And that's how I kept to know him. And speaking about that, that there, we, we didn't have oil. We didn't turn on the oil. At Melville, there was a coaling station. This is now is the Melville Fuel Depot. But then it was the Naval Coaling Station. And we came in from sea, and we came back past the Breton Point lightship. That was a, a lightship that was out here at its turning point. Everybody that came in from sea was glad to see that. And we came in, and we were right off the dumplings. That's the Jamestown, where the house is on there, belongs to Wortham's on Jamestown, on the island. And we pulled up in there, and we saw this tug coming down, puffing the steam down, and she had three coal barges. When we dropped anchor, the tug came alongside, and everybody started shoveling coal. Everybody had it, there, officers and everything. And we were all in whites, and we had, a, had the buckets, the uh, canvas buckets, and the boom slung out, and uh, everybody turned to. And every two hours, they had, a, they had a roll call check to make sure that nobody would disappear from the coal loading process. And we didn't stop for dinner, we started at 6 o'clock in the morning. We had a cup of coffee and a piece of toast in our hands. In the noon time, the band played, and we were eating sandwiches with coal dust. And this was fine coal, soft coal that they were burning, and had to go down through the chutes right down to the, to the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, Utah. And after we got through with those three, there was two more barges coming down. That took us a day and a half to load that battleship with those five barges of coal. And that was our means of propellers. That was unusual to do it out there in the harbor, wasn't it? Didn't no. they usually go abo uh, alongside the docks? They couldn't because the battleship drew too much, uh, uh, too much uh, water. They they had to be in the channel, and that's deep water on the on the, uh, on the Jamestown side between Jamestown and Newport on the west side no. there, uh, the east side of uh, Jamestown. And uh, we figured this way after we got all the uh, all the uh, coal aboard that we'd get Liberty. And of course they piped down, the boats and come along with a pipe whistle and blew down there and you listen to him and he says, prepare the guardrails and prepare for sea. We thought we were going to get liberty, so we had to wash down, put the guardrails up and instead of getting the liberty, we went right out to sea. So that's the story <laughs> of my tough day. You want to know about the ships in the harbor. And up until the, uh, the tail end of the ships in Newport here, uh, at the Naval Torpedo Station, uh, we had, uh, we had ramps in there that the four stack destroyers uh, could pull in and load the torpedoes and back right out between the, uh, the, the New England steamship dock and the uh, torpedo station and head right out towards King Park or right around the uh, uh, north end of the torpedo station and right out to sea. And that way, uh, and then the uh, destroyers uh, were added up there what they could up in Melville and at the training station. And at times there, they had to build time. They built the piers, and we had as high as 56 destroyers here at one time. And that's where the detriment came from us for the city of Newport when the Navy pulled out of here. And we lost a lot of money. But still in all, we had something else to come back that it did But it was tough about the, about the priority ratings. And I, th I stated previous that this chief boatswain mate, QC Taddy, I, supposed to be a friend of mine, he came up and he picked all the blocks that I wanted. When I went over to see in the, in the office and, 
and Lieutenant Talbot. <laughs> I says, how about my priority? And Teddy, I told me where I could go. I says, you can go too. <laughs> so I didn't get any priority, for he wouldn't give me any priority for, to replace the block. So we had no stock. We couldn't do anything without a priority. So that's one of those things that I can, I'll never forget. Uh, out of the rum deal that he gave yeah, me. A good friend. Yeah, a good friend. He gave me the needle. <laughs> so I guess he I guess he was working for the Navy and not for JT. <laughs> well, he got out at 35 years, so he was in the Navy at some time. He was a Navy man. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, um, the 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 times that I suppose the um, all of the blackouts and all of the rationings the same to you as everybody else you're just the same the blackouts uh, the windows were black and the, uh, uh, the blinds were closed and they had dark colored shades were put on there and if there was any lights in the in the house when the uh, when the uh, siren sounded for a uh, for an air raid a uh, brick came through the window if there was any light so you had to watch out because you'd get a broken glass and, the, and a brick in the window so that, that'll take care of that part. Now, you want to go from there, Mrs. Chairman? Well, I was wondering, uh, did you have any friends at the torpedo station that lost their jobs when the torpedo station closed? Oh, yes. We had a lot of friends that, that, that knew that, uh, some, of course, some of them were the uh, mechanics. They went to Providence and uh, Boston and New York because they were mechanics, you know, and uh, there wasn't that, that much in here, you know. So uh, that that took care of, uh, of that there, but... Uh, as I say, uh, it was kind of a sort of a ghost town after, after uh, the torpedo station closed down. Yeah. Um, let's uh, find out uh, whether the uh, changes in the summer colony affected you in your work. I wouldn't think it probably did. You did tell me that your father was. Um, up in Portsmouth working. Uh, did he work to the end of his life up in Portsmouth at no. the Vanderbilt? No, he's place? changed around here. Yeah. Uh, I suppose, as um, far as you were concerned, uh, having been at JT's, you really didn't have any changes as the summer colony sort of drifted away and, and uh, became less important. No. This part of town. No, uh, uh, we didn't have anything of that there, but uh, uh, the younger generation after the war, uh, the younger generation, uh, they did not open the houses. Some of the houses were cl left closed and boarded up, just as they do in the wintertime when they go away. Yeah. And we never had any of that trouble at all. We still did business with the estates, you know, for the caretakers. They had to use paint and, uh, and stuff for maintenance, and they all bought the stuff through. O'Connell here was a the biggest distributor in the town here at the time. Uh, let's, um, let's talk about the Fall River line. Mm -hmm. uh, every Newport boy always went, went down to see the boat off at some time in his life. Tell me some of the remembrances you have of the Fall River line. Well, I can tell you that, uh, as I stated previously, when we came out from New York, I told you on the, uh, on the last, last recording of my, my trips when we came out from New York in the first time. But uh, <clears throat> after we got married here, uh, uh, and the family was uh, big, uh, uh, we had, where we were living, uh, we lived on the corner of Marlboro and Thames Street. And on the top of that building, uh, there was a widow's walk. It was a three-story building, and the widow's walk was on top, and it was all enclosed. And we had an apartment on the, uh, on the uh, uh, third floor. And then we access, had an access to that widow's walk upstairs. And Mrs. McFoley and myself, in the first year we got married and living there, we used to go up and sit there and there in the nights and watch the New York boat come down from Fall River and tie up to the dock and watch it go out. And a moonlight night, we'd sit up there with the breezes blowing there, and we enjoyed it very much. And another thing, when the children got bigger, uh, uh, we used to take them down to, the, uh, down to the docks because the boat came in at 5 minutes to 9, shop at 10 minutes to 9 or 5 minutes to 9, every night shop from Fall River. And then they'd start loading the fish. And uh, the uh, uh, fish would get onto the, uh, onto the boat. They would start loading that fish. And uh, uh, it took a long time sometimes to load that fish. And I'm uh, going to tell you what will happen, uh, happen later on in the later years. And then they think go.
mine didn't want to stay down, but it is down now. Well, the last thing we were talking about is on the uh, on the Navy and That's the rich uh, the summer estates here. If it had any effect on us when the Navy moved out, so at the time I just gave you a rough break of what what happened here. That didn't we didn't notice anything. We've gone further. We're on the Fall River boat. Oh now. yes, we're well, on the Fall River. Well, it started on the Fall River line, and uh, as I stated, we used to be in that uh, widow's walk upstairs on the top floor, the third floor, top of the third floor, and uh, when the children got small. Uh, uh, we'd uh, take the children down to the dock about quarter past eight and wait for the Fall River line to come in. And also, there was a lot of people, that's what the people did in the summertime, they go down and watch that boat come in. And then we also hear the, heard the whistle coming around and the tra uh, steam train from Boston came down at quarter past nine with all the business people that were going to New York. That was the people that left the businessmen in New York and Boston and they took that uh, uh, boat train from Boston to uh, to the Fall River Line dock, and that train came right down, and that was a steam train, and the children got a, a kick out of it because when he when he come down, the engineer would have to pull the throttle and let the steam come out, and they'd get a kick out of running through the uh, uh, through the uh, through the uh, smoke, smoke and, 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 the, and the children on the dock, and they got a great kick out of it, and there used to be a lot of people. They, they came down, they had about five cars out of Boston. And that was a good help for them. And then they also had a baggage car, and they had to take the bags and whatever freight come on and put it down. And we enjoyed that very much. But speaking on the Fall River Line, uh, we got married in 1926, on June the 3rd, 1926. And uh, uh, we had we had such we got going down on the honeymoon on the boat, so we got down there about quarter of nine. And we had a big gang there. Everybody had packages there, and some, they put a baby carriage on it for dock, and put a dummy baby in there, and says, "Here's what you're coming to." And then everything, and, and everything, uh, and and we kept watching, hoping that the boat go out. And we got in the dock, you know, and he blow the whistle, and there was such a load of fish that they were running down with these hand trucks and rounding the freight part of the bar, and it it was an excessive amount of barrel fish that was going to Fulton Market in, in New York. The following morning, so we went aboard the uh, the boat, uh, the Commonwealth it was that we went down, and uh, as we came down, uh, got back, and then we came out to the rail, got to the stateroom, we came out to the rail, and everybody was hollering at us and kidding us, and then of course this uh, big colored gentleman Porter came up to me and he says, "You, Mr. McPoland?" I said, "Yes, sir, I'm Mr. McPoland." He says, "Well, this is, this is your package," he says, "and you ought to open it here." He says, I says, I can't open it. He, he says, I was given five dollars to open it, tell you to open this package here. I says, well, if they gave you five dollars to open this package here, I says, you see that water between the dock and the rail? I said, you start opening that package, I says, you'll go over. And you know that boat never left that dock till ten minutes to one? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, ten minutes to one that the, that the boat left the dock because there was so much fish, they had to get all that fish into the market. So that's that's the story of the Fall River Line, and that's the tail end of the part there that I and I miss it. And then when it folded up in 1937, everybody missed it. And another thing, they sold the material, and I bought some bunk beds from the staterooms. And another thing, we didn't have running water on those on Fall River Line. We had uh, uh, basins with a pitcher for washing, and had a pitcher of water in there. And if you needed more water, you had to go get it. And we had. Uh, 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 chambers, what they call chambers, uh, in other words, known as uh, uh, pots. So we uh, uh, took those and, and I bought some of the uh, uh, the pots because the children were small. I suppose these people will know what the pots are when the children were small, what they were used for. So anyway, I bought these pots. I made a big, big mistake. I didn't get the ones with the gold trim. Oh. I got the ones. I got a few with the gold trim, but I bought the others, the plain ones with no gold trims. And you know, and they found out that McFollin bought the bought the uh, the chambers from the Fall River Line. Everybody come looking for chambers with a gold gold trim, and I didn't have any gold trim. They were worth a dollar. Selling them for a dollar with the gold trim, and I had to sell the plain chambers for twenty five cents. But we held that that thing. And I got rid of the chambers. And the bunks we kept until the boys were put into 15. We cut the things and made the tier bunks in the house, and we had the springs and everything. So they enjoyed that. 
So that was the end of the fall of the line in 1937, and it was a shame to see that thing go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful kid. Yeah, and many experiences, and I enjoyed that very much. And the, uh, the, it was it was so elegant, and the, the music, and the, the, well, it's the, just the very elegant. Well, the music played till 10 yeah. o'clock. They played that up on the grand stairway, up the top of the grand stairway, till 10 o'clock, the music played. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did you have this now because I put in uh, uh, the wrong tape at the wrong time. This will be um, beginning at the at the proper subject, which is I think four river boats in just one second. Um, the Depression hit us all, and I wonder if you have any special uh, remembrances of when the stock market crashed. You didn't have any stock, but you knew the stock market had crashed. Then when did it uh, make a, a difference in your work? Well, in the, uh, in the Depression, uh, where I was employed at O'Connell's, uh, uh, Mr. O'Connell never left anybody off the job. He kept all the help on there. And all the help, the business was slow during the Depression, very slow. Outside of uh, material use was just for uh, emergency repairs like sleeks in the roof and plumbing and stuff like that. But major repairs were out. And uh, Mr. O'Connell, uh, we had uh, what he did, uh, we had a lot of paint that uh, dented cans. And we had these. Uh, uh, big like whiskey barrels, and he used to dump all the uh, all the paint in the uh, in these whiskey barrels, and had the broken oars. You know, they're like uh, take an eight foot oar, and it was broken half, and they found it, stored it off, and turned the paddle and mixed the paint up, and everybody, even the girls in the office, and everybody was painting the buildings and repairing, and some of some of them did carpenter work and everything. And after the depression come along. Uh, that was a, a multicolored, uh, uh, multicolor uh, job, and of course we also bought a lot of uh, olive drab paint in five-gallon cans from the army as a surplus material, and we mixed that up. And some of the buildings were painted in olive drab, another drab was pink, another one was blue. But you talk about a camouflage, but still in all it preserved the it preserved the building, and that's how we got the long tour of depression. But nobody was laid off on the Depression. He kept everybody there. It was a tough thing to do, but uh, it cost him some money. But still in all, when things came back, he still had the same help there. He didn't have to worry about starting over with new help. And I imagine uh, JT's uh, did get probably uh, back on its feet as soon as anybody could build again and, and uh, repair it came back faster than some oh, of yes. the other. Oh when, when yes. Uh, when the money came in, when people came in, got some money, they went into the better, bigger repairs. There wasn't any, not too much building, but uh, there was a lot of repair work done on these houses. Uh, I suppose you knew some people that lost their jobs and were really having a very hard time. Oh yes, they were having a hard time all right. <laughs> There's a lot of people that was in here, and then you you look around, and you had some of friends of mine that I'd see, and I'd stop them down there, and some of the married fellows, younger married fellows, and my age, it was out of work, and hey Mac, have you got a dollar? You know, it, it was it was really tough, and and things were getting tough, and the food was getting very scarce. Yeah, it was a terrible thing for those people that didn't have their jobs. But uh. uh you look at around and, and the depression. And after we bought all this uh, uh, during the war, we had a, the navy came in and took our uh, our stock of rope. We had a whole floor full of rope from from quarter inch up to six inch uh, six inch diameter rope and coils. And they demanded that rope, and they took it up outside of Albany to a warehouse in Albany, and uh, uh, we didn't have any rope to sell. And we needed it for the fishing boats and the, and the construction around the docks. And uh, we couldn't do anything about that. And after we went up to look at surface material up in the uh, uh, surplus division outside of Albany, uh, uh, New York, and uh, what do I run into but that whole pile of rope that came from O'Connell's, and they never used it. 
and it was still up there. But st instead of being in the building to keep the dry, uh, all the rope was out in the weather, and it was getting wet, the burlap and the rope, and it was moldy. And all the stuff that should have been outside was inside. So they just kept the reverse. So that goes to show you how much is being done with the, uh, with the material. How much the waste, there, how much is. waste there is. Yeah. And us taxpayers are paying for this. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, you told me when you were a little boy, you picked dandelions. And I asked if your mother made or your father made wine. And you said, not right then. Tell me what you remember about prohibition. Well, <laughs> prohibition. There was a lot of a uh, uh, lot of things of prohibition. You could uh, walk in up and down the street, and then you, you could smell uh, you could smell the beer brewing and everything else. Because when they throw the mash out of making a beer and the home brew, uh, <laughs> uh, they throw it in the backyard, and you could tell you think it was a brewery. But everybody made wine and uh, and beer and everything. Uh, so most of the people that you knew made some kind of wine from, from something or other. Uh, nobody in your family were teetotalers or were against drinking, I hope. No, they weren't against drinking, but they would take a drink. My father would take beer, and he, he'd take a few highballs, and then, uh, of course, uh, nobody overdid it. Uh, do, what do you know about the uh, rum running and the smuggling? Have any friends uh, mixed up in that? Well, I uh, <laughs> I don't want to commit myself, but uh, uh, I know a lot of people that uh, uh, that were uh, fishermen, and uh, as the fishermen turned uh, from the small boats, uh, uh, they developed into high speed boats. I don't know what these high speed boats were doing here, but they uh, went out. And the only thing that I uh, that I could tell you is that a uh, uh, thing that I remember perfectly uh, in regard to uh, the question you asked me about if I had any friends. Well, of course, I stated and I worked for O'Connell and I had, the, uh, I had the key of the store and I got a call this night at half past seven and he wanted to know if I'd come down to the city dock and see him. So I went down to the city dock and that's the uh, off Long Wharf there at the city yard used to be there and they were tied up alongside, this boat was tied up alongside. And I saw the captain of the boat and he asked me if I'd get him a quarter, uh, uh, half a coil of three quarter inch rope and a couple of fire extinguishers and some further foul weather gear. So uh, we went over to the store and I got the truck out, the, out of the storeroom and put the rope in the uh, car and uh, the fire extinguisher and stuff and delivered it over to the uh, uh, the boat on the dock, and of course, before he left the store, he paid me cash for all the uh, the merchandise here. And I didn't ask him or anything about uh, what was going. I he just asked me for a favor to to get the rope. So I uh, I stayed aboard the boat, and I must have been aboard the boat about an hour or two and a fat. And he says we got to shove off. So uh, I says uh, God speed to you, and they shoved off. So they went out, and I went home. And I come to work in half past seven the next morning. I met this fellow there. He says, Roy, he says, uh, he said, did you hear about it? I hear about what? He says, uh, about the boat coming into the harbor. I said, what was that? He says, well, the black duck was coming into the harbor at half past three this morning, and the Coast Guard hit him with the, with the uh, one-pounders. They didn't stop for him. The black duck, they didn't stop for him. And uh, they opened fire on him, and they killed all but one, and he died afterwards. And the boat was taken into uh, into custody with a uh, load of contraband. I don't know what kind of contraband there was, and I'm not in a position to say what kind of contraband was in there. But uh, they uh, they didn't sink the boat; they just hit the uh, superstructure. And the boat, later years, the uh, Coast Guard converted that boat, and she was in the Coast Guard service with these high-speed engines. So it was the black duck that you had sat, sat on the night before? It was a black duck that I sat on half past seven that night. I'm glad you didn't go out to sea with them just to have a little trip out in the bay. Well, I've been asked to go out, but I never, I never went out. <laughs> I never did that. <laughs> but the, the waterfront was uh, alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, speaking about alive, and there were some sportsmen in the, uh, out of New York that won fame for their deeds that were working on these high-speed engines 
as mechanics. And I'm not in a position to tell you who they were, but you'll have to read in between the lines and uh, if you see anything, but that's one of the things that I remember there. And then there was a lot of it over in Jamestown, too. The boats were going both places, weren't they? Bringing their stuff in over both sides. I wouldn't sides. know where they went. The <laughs> boats were in the water, but I couldn't tell you where the boats went. Well, now how about speakeasies in your neighborhood? Well, they weren't known as speakeasies. They were uh, known as just uh, 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 cool parlors. In other words, just a soda palace. They never knew about the speakeasies. They were just a soda palace. You'd go in there and get a drink of uh, soda. The sailors knew where they were. Well. Of course they did. One of these questions here was, uh, when the smugglers were caught, do you think people sympathized with them or with the law? Well, some did and some didn't. I can remember uh, one case that a uh, uh, fellow had a small boat and uh, he went out to sea somewhere and he came in uh, uh, into three, around three o'clock in the morning and a spy came in and he couldn't read the compass and it said they're taking a shortcut at Fort Adams. There's a red light, blinking red light right at the end of Fort Adams. He's come into the entrance of the harbor and uh, he ran aground. And this cargo then, at that time, there was a, uh, uh, there was a uh, army barracks at Fort Adams. And uh, the stuff that I understood was in there was uh, what he had as a cargo coming in was uh, Belgium alcohol and five gallon cans. And when he ran aground, there was nothing left of that five gallon cans of alcohol aboard. All of he had a bare boat, and the boat was aground on the rocks, and he had no thing. Okay. And, and so far, right from the, uh, uh, right from home, that he didn't make it, and somebody borrowed all the alcohol. Those soldiers are pretty smart, I bet. <laughs> all right. Moran. About the uh, the bootleggers and uh, the home brew, and uh, I don't think it's important to know whether or not you feel that most people in Newport wanted prohibition or didn't want it. I think that. Uh, Nobody really wanted prohibition except a few, a, a few, few wives a who few had to, a few teetotalers that didn't want it. Didn't, that's all. But everybody took a drink and everything else. And I, uh, I never seen anything in the families around. They enjoyed themselves and over a meal and wine and so forth. Now, where were you when the hurricane of 1938 came? Well, I tell you, in the 1938 hurricane, uh, I was down at Long Wharf. And uh, the uh, sky started to darken up about 12 o'clock. And about, uh, about a little after one, the uh, waves start hitting the seawall. And around two o'clock, the, uh, the rats came up out of the seawall and start running up along the seawall and running up towards Thames Street. There was a small rats, old slimy rats, and little ones, and they were followed right along there. And we took, we were in uh, uh, about uh, 10 inches of water that was breaking over the seawall, and we took pickaxe handles and tried to hit them up, but they didn't pay any attention to us, and they did not come back or try to try to jump us. And uh, uh, at about uh, half past two, that uh, storm broke, and as the water started coming over the seawall, and we had uh, as broke the windows in the store, and we had 48 inches of water in the store with no windows in there and we had to stay there all that night and drive people away from looting and we had nothing to to do only with the pickaxe handles to keep the people out of there just to run in and get in the uh, merchandise and it wasn't until uh, it was until that past 10 the next morning until I come home because we were in there and we were up to our, our hips in water. Now did the telephone stay in? No the telephones went out because we were all underwater, all the switchboards was under. So we had 48 inches of water there. And the lights went out too? Yeah, and the lights went out. All we had to do was had lanterns. We had lanterns. We had kerosene lanterns. We filled them before the storm and, and uh, battery lanterns and flashlights. We uh, uh, utilized all those uh, lights. How many Navy men in there knew that a hurricane was coming up? Well, I don't know how many knew that it was coming in, but uh, uh, it certainly was a, it's a good sign and then uh, uh, 
uh, pulling up and after the hurricane uh, came down and uh, the telephones were out and we were uh, uh, watching the people in about two o'clock in the morning I happened to look out from Long Wharf and I looked over towards King Park and saw these flames coming up from the uh, from the uh, from the trees amongst the trees and then uh, somebody went over to the fire department and told them you know the fire department came back after the water receded but that they had no telephone communications and he told them that there was fire with the trees down there so they sent apparatus down there to put the fire out and they were sending it near Spencer Park up on the, near Chestlock Avenue so that was a and it was a devastating my wife and children went down and wanted to see what 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 happened to the uh, to the uh, to the wharfs and the docks? Yeah. But the the uh, the people that were living where the trees were coming down was very dangerous. Oh yes, electric wires were down. They were mm. they we had to, they had to stay inside. They didn't dare to go out because they, until they start to part of public works and electric corporation to these wires, you didn't know whether you trapped on live wires or not. And of course, as you know, uh, when that storm hit, there was over three hundred fifty people died in this area. Yeah. Do you know any, uh, have you got a really good story about something very dramatic that happened in that hurricane? Well, nearly the, everybody knew of one, one dramatic story. Well, the, the only thing that I remember that uh, was dramatic, you're asking in that question, is that uh, uh, this woman about uh, 70 years of age, uh, she got caught in a swirl and she had two mattresses and she laid on those two mattresses and she got washed up on the shore. They took him right in, and she saved her life by hanging on to those two mattresses. She tied two mattresses together, and the seas took her right in, and she landed on. They landed on the beach, and she's seventy years of age. That's the only thing that I can remember. Uh, yeah. Where had she been with the two mattresses? Well, it's two mattresses. Her house, the house. Went, the house. And she away. grabbed the two mattresses before the water started coming in. I, I call that a very dramatic well, story. Well, that's, uh, that's something. That's. Uh, and the tail, you know. And what about the jazz festivals? Well, the jazz festival, we had uh, we had quite a time here. We had uh, near riots and everything else here. And uh, as I stated before, that uh, 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 Mrs. McFoland rented rooms here and uh, for the jazz festival, and uh, uh, we never had any trouble with them outside of uh, early morning hours coming in. And uh, to top it off, that. Uh, uh, Mrs. McPoland used to do to all the washing of the clothes on the sheets, and uh, uh, she pressed the sheets and made everything handy for them, and uh, uh, we only got five dollars a night per person, but tonight now they're getting now for a room here now for a festival when it comes in, they're getting anywhere from 110 to 150 dollars per night, and all that you get, what do you get? You don't get much, all that you get is the, is the toilet facilities, and a bed to sleep in, and some rooms you don't even get a television. And they, they're willing to pay that price. But still, when we had it, when Mrs. McFoland was renting rooms out, they were squawking because they had to pay $5. But we've had a lot of incidents during the jazz festival where we had to turn the hose on the people to quiet them down a near riots here. And it was very interesting, and that's why it, it was eliminated after two or three years. Um, we've already covered when the Navy fleet left and uh, Newport thought it was at the end, but it didn't turn out to be the end because then the tourists started. Yeah, to the come. tourists took over here now. And then another thing is, uh, before the Navy left here, years ago, the, uh, uh, what they got is American Cup Highway along here now. Years ago, the uh, city council were talking about a putting in waterfront street alongside comparable with Thames Street, but that, that was knocked down. And what they got now is a catastrophe here with the American Cup Highway running from, uh, <laughs> from Marlborough Street right down to, <laughs> down to Mill Street. It, it is a catastrophe right down to Memorial Boulevard. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, waterfront street should have been uh, put in there, but it was defeated by, uh, by a coal company and a fish company that didn't want to uh, move out, they could have used the coal company to the end of the dock and used the ramp over the top and let the cars and traffic travel underneath it. But uh, they uh, they didn't do that. They turned it down. It was too much money and everything. But I I look back, and where I came from, where I used to go fishing when I was a child down the Bay Shore, uh, they built uh, 
they built docks out in the water. And out of those docks, they used railroad ties, creosoted railroad ties, and what they used for fill was clamshells, and they filled it with clamshells. And when I was down there in, uh, in uh, 1965, when I went down to visit there, when I had to change out of my Social Security to go to Iceland to get my birth certificate, and uh, that those docks are still there and are still standing. And here in Newport, they didn't want to do anything. They could have used the garbage fill and put cement over the top of the garbage fill. They wouldn't have any trouble. They had a good waterfront street and no trouble now. But right at the present time, it's a, it's a catastrophe for the people that come into town. You have to go from Thames Street, from uh, Marlborough Street, right down American Hub Highway. You'll have to go down there. It'll take you about three quarters of an hour to get downtown. Bumper to bumper. <laughs> so that, that part of that, that question you answered me, is that, does that answer your purpose, to uh, answer your question? Uh, what about some of the restoration and redevelopment that was good, though? There has been some that is good. Well, there's a lot of been good. I can't uh, tell you there, but I know there's a lot of work that's been done on the restoration of a lot of these places, especially uh, uh, coming around here uh, on different places like West Broadway. For instance, that was, uh, uh, that was a dilapidated area. But still and all, with the restoration and uh, everything else changed around, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful redevelopment now to see these buildings that's on these places that were all wrecks. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fine. Of course, I think all this uh, uh, building they're doing on the waterfront is perfectly terrible because there certainly is not any... Uh, no, I, dis I disagree with I disagree on that. I, I, you like the I mean, hotels? No, I, I, I'm... I only oh, I'll disagree take with, with, with that. I'll take that back. Oh. Uh, that's a disgrace by putting these buildings up and con uh, confining the people away from the waterfront because they're putting these buildings up and you can't go on their property. That's their property. And that's depleting the waterfront. That should never been. And they're still doing it. And before somebody <laughs> gets hurt, they should take and cut this right down. No more building in the city of Newport. They've got it up. Well, they certainly have got enough as far as the waterfront cleanliness goes because I don't think any of our sewers are going to be able to take all those people's stuff away. And around Brenton Cove there, those condominiums that have all built, been built up there. Well, well I give it now. They're not, pump, they're not pumping into there. They're pumping into the pumping station. They're not, uh, well, I wonder if it's all going to pump into the pumping station. Well, I station. don't think so. I don't know whether anybody's checked that, but that, that Brenton Cove and all along there, that should be pumped into the uh, uh, settling basin at Wellington Park. There's a, a micro-filling station down the settling park instead of the water. But all those places uh, along the waterfront in Brenton Cove are dumping their sewage and everything right into the water. And I don't know if that's clean now or not. I haven't been swimming over there, so I can't tell you whether <laughs> this thing's or not. Um, I think that that is, uh, I think that's about enough. Well, whatever you want to do. I think we've got enough about uh, your memories of Newport. If, um, if you think there's some more things that you would like to say, let's cut this off. You told me that you were, I think the phrase is, a call man for the fire department? Yes. Uh I was a call man in the uh, Newport Fire Department for 49 years. Will you explain what a call man is? Well, because when the fire department was organized, uh, uh, they only had uh, two men at the stations, just enough to take the apparatus out. And they pulled an outside alarm to call members in of the fire department, the permanent members of the fire department. And uh, as, they, as, the, uh, as the city grew, and they put more fire apparatus in to the city. Uh, they put more permanent men in the stations. And at that time, uh, uh, they pulled it in, and then the man joining the fire department, he would go uh, in a, uh, as a member of the fire department, and he would seven days a week, and he would put in, uh, get an hour off for breakfast, an hour for dinner, an hour for supper. And one night, uh, one night a week, from 7 to 11, he would have an evening off. And every second week, they would have a day off. And that was for the permanent men. Now, when I, yeah, that's where the department started. And of course, uh, the call force, they didn't have enough men in the stations manning these 
stations and the, and pull the hose around that they had to strike an outside alarm if there was a big fire to to call help in to help them to fight the fires. Now, when I went on in 1926, when I started in there, uh, uh, in 1926, I went in and deployed for the job as a call man. And uh, I went down and saw the chief, and I said, to, I, uh, I understand uh, the, you're going to appoint a call man tonight. And he says, yes, I am. I said, well, I'm next. And he says, you're not. Somebody else is ahead of you. I says, listen, I said, don't pull that because uh, his father-in-law's on this fire department. I said, don't pull that stuff on me because if you do, I'm going up to the city hall and squawk about that. And he said, he says to me, he says, you're a wise kid, ain't you? I says, I'm not a wise kid. I says, I'm just looking around for my wife, uh, my my own side. So he says, well, he says, uh, he says, all right. He says, you go down to Dr. Keenan's and and get a physical examination. So I went down to Dr. Keenan's and he was on on Marlboro Street, and Dr. Keenan said to me, he says, Roy, he says, you all right? I said, sure, I'm fine, Doc. I said, what's the matter? So he says, here, I think that's something short of the chief. So he says, McFolan's okay, give him a physical. So I went on the call force of the Newport Fire Department in 1926. And I was on at 1936 until 1932. Uh, I didn't get any pay. The only pay that I received uh, was uh, $14 when one of the... Uh, other callmen got sick and he couldn't attend to the alarms. So I got $14 from 1926 to 1932. That's all I got. So we go along further and uh, every time I uh, look around now and we got at that time after I was made permanent callman we got $75 a year and we were on call for 24 hours a day. And we had to furnish our own coats and our own boots and our own rain hat before we got helmets. And uh, but we we saved the city a lot of time. And I was on there until I became a 70 years of age, and they told me they didn't need me anymore. So it was a shame to go out. But that was the 49 years that I put in there. And uh, uh, I've had very nice experience with the members of the call force. And I stayed. I don't know where I stayed it. But when I went on in 52, uh, there in, in 1926, there was 52 callmen. And when that whistle blew, everybody had to come in. If the fire was uptown, you would go to the station or to the fire uptown. And if, the, uh, if they needed more help, they would strike a second alarm, and the second alarm would call everybody into the fire. So that's the way it was situated, and that's why they needed the help. So... Uh, uh, when I got out in 1970, it was diminished down. There was only about 15 callmen. See, they made the part the department permanent. They kept putting more apparatus and. Uh, well, now I don't understand. You didn't go to your own fire station. You went wherever the fire was. Where when the you, fire was. When you heard if, the if, whistle. If you were, if you were in the uptown district, if you were in the fire district uptown, and the fire was uptown, and they pulled the box first alarm, you go to the fire because you'd have a card telling you where that box was that they pulled. So you'd go to that fire. And the fellows downtown, in the downtown stations, would go to their stations. Now, if they found out that they need more help, the captain of the watch would call up the station and tell them to strike a general alarm. Yeah. And all these other fellows in the other stations, they would all come to the fire. And that, that built up the manpower. Now you were trained uh, to, to do all the different uh, kinds of, uh, uh, you, you handle the hoses, uh, and uh, did you go, uh, did you climb in the buildings with your axes? Oh yes. You we, did any of the things? We did everything that the firemen do. We went in and knocked the petitions down, took the hoses in, and all of the, the callmen never operated the uh, pumpus. They had permanent men operating the pumpus, but the callmen did everything that the firemen did. We went in and knocked the fire down. We had to go in through the smoke. And, and at that time, we didn't have any air packs. We had to take the smoke and it... Uh, <laughs> now you were, uh, uh, even though you weren't getting paid very much, you were employees of the city. Were you insured by the city during those times? Well, if, you get got the, hurt, if, if, you got, if you got hurt, they would take care of the doctor's bill to a certain amount, but not too many. And uh, 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 they would uh, get uh, 
uh, in, in my career, the 49 years that I was in the hospital, I uh, in, in, in the in the call in the call force, uh, I, I was in the hospital three times, and that was overcome of smoke. The way I've been overcome of smoke, and I, uh, it's a funny feeling to to get that when you get in there. I can remember uh, uh, down at Swanhurst, uh, in the garage at Swanhurst, that's a, a stone building, and that's a slate roof. And uh, we went down on the second alarm on there, and we had to go up and through the uh, door on the second floor, and I went in with a hose and with another fella, and we put in there, and, and the first thing you know, I start choking, and the thing, the other fireman that was with me, he says, catch McPole and he's going to fall. And the feeling that I get, the sensation, was that I was I was standing up and somebody had a bottle of ether and was throwing ether in it and another person had a fan and it was throwing the ether under my nose and that's when I went out. And all else I could hear at the tail end was somebody grabbed McPole and he's falling. So they grabbed me and they took me to the hospital. And I don't know how I got to the hospital because they didn't have any emergency wagon at that time, and they must have thrown me in the in the black and the black Mariah, which is known as the police wagon. So I went to the hospital, and <laughs> uh, Mrs. Sweeney, she was a rich lady that was down the avenue, and she had something to do with Swanhurst, and uh, uh, she came out to the hospital to see me, and, and and when I saw her, she kept me some cigars. She gave me a dozen uh, Corona Coronas, twenty-five cent cigars, and. I, like a fool, I left the cigars on the table beside my bed. And the chief came in about noon time and, and see how I was feeling. He came in and he says, what's this here? You were overcome by smoke at Swanhurst. What year was that? Well, I can't remember that. That was uh, way back. I can't recall. And there I they had another fire later on. Yes, but this was the first one. This was uh, uh, previous to that. It's in the book here. I'll right. ha I'd have right. to look it up. Uh, would you like to tell me other times that you got hurt, or would you like to tell me other fires that you remember? Well, I think uh, considering this one, I uh, uh, I fell on the ice, and as another fellows did in the, in the icing conditions in the winter time, from the uh, water from the hose freezing and uh, it was very slippery and we had no spikes in our boots and we'd fall and hurt ourselves and uh, as i stated previous uh the uh, case at swanhurst is the one i remember because that's the time i was in the hospital for the uh, longest length of time and uh, if you want me to continue uh, now uh, into the fire department i can uh, continue along here uh considering here uh, I'll start with myself, as, uh, since I've been in the department as a callman, uh, the jobs that I held in the, uh, in the fire department. Uh, I was secretary and treasurer for the Newport Callman for 10 years. And I was uh, president of the Newport County Firemen's League from 1972 till 1973. Uh, if, uh, I'll give you a, a small outline of the uh, of the uh, uh, Fireman's Relief Association. This Fireman's Relief Association is over a hundred years old and it was started by the old timers in the uh, in the uh, fire department and they were all call members so just for a benefit. At that time uh, previous to that uh, the uh, uh, fees, the dues uh, were a dollar a year and uh, the death benefits was $150 for that dollar a year. That was your protection you got. And as I stated, uh, this was over 100 years old, and we just celebrated. And uh, I'll give a rough outline of what the Fireman's Relief Association is, as is and what it consists of. This association is for the benefit of the call men and also the permanent men of the Newport Fire Department. The dues at present time is $3 a year. And... Uh, <coughs> And if you got hurt at a fire, uh, at a fire, the association would pay you two dollars a day uh, for 26 weeks. And if the uh, injury went beyond the 26 weeks, you would get paid a dollar a day for 26 weeks also. Plus, if you were a permanent man, you received your day's pay and 
also an advertisement from their state. And if in the event that any fireman died going to, at coming from a fire or at the fire, uh, this family would receive $300 death benefits, plus the de death benefits from the state and the city death benefits. This was my job as treasurer, as I would have to take care of, of these accidents. And I held this job in the Relief Association for 40 years. And after all this time as treasurer, I thought it was about time I let myself loose and let someone else take over this job. So on January the 21st, uh, 17th, 1984, uh, I turned the job over to another fireman. And this job I, I hated to, to lose because I enjoyed it very much. Now, uh, that's the condition of the fire department. Give you the call men and the fire and the permanent men. And uh, do you want me to continue with the fires in Newport? I think that would be very interesting. Your experience in uh, a few of the fires. All right. Well, as I stated today, I uh, was in all these fires and took part in all these fires because what I've taken uh, into consideration is taking the major fires in the city. Uh, the first thing we'll start in, in 1925, the Newport City Hall was destroyed by fire, and a lot of records, city records were lost, and the entire building was destroyed. The third floor came down and took everything down to the first floor. Captain Malloy from station number four had a heart attack, and they pulled him out, and he died on the front lawn of the city hall. And uh, it took a long while to rebuild the city hall, as this is a uh, stone building, and as you'll notice at the present time, in the 84s here, that the uh, upper stories is cement and not the uh, uh, field stone blocks that's in the rest of the city hall. And that's for that uh, one. On January the 16th, 35, uh, I was home for lunch, and a big explosion took place on Mount Vernon Street. Because of, the, uh, because of the fire, a man was smoking in the cellar cleaning paintbrushes with turpentine. And the fire and the explosion blew him across the, the, uh, the kitchen floor. And Do you remember what part of Mount Vernon Street that was? Yes, I, I can tell you that uh, it's about number 2028, 20, I think, somewhere around there. Well, it, does, it doesn't make any yeah. difference. It's, it's a house near Bull Street. Yeah, then. yes. And then uh, yeah, yeah. the man was... <coughs> Uh, blown between the rafters. After the fire was put out, Captain Molloy told me to get two blankets from the truck. I asked him what I was to do with these blankets. He told me to get another man and myself and go inside and pick up the body. This was a tough thing for me to do as I just had my lunch and it sure was upset my stomach to see this gentleman in this condition. The next fire was the uh, on February the 27th, 1935, uh, a, general alarm, a general alarm fire at the Sherman Building on Thames Street. In this building was the plant of the Newport Daily News. Two days before the fire, the Daily News received a large supply of, of stock for the paper. It was stored in the basement and in the rear part near the press and all was destroyed from water damage. And that takes care of that Sherman Building. On March the 1st, 1936, uh, this is in between here, the first rescue truck in the Newport Fire Department was converted from an old fire truck. All this work was done in the fire, by the firemen in their spare time, and the truck lasted in this capacity for three years until a new rescue truck uh, was born. Getting back to fires, on May the 31st, 1938, uh, flames swept through the Wysong Villa on Oka Point, known as Greystone. It was one of the oldest in this section of the summer colony. It was completely destroyed. To give you some idea where this uh, Greystone building was, it's across from uh, the breakers and where the, fire, and where the uh, building stood, uh, it is now used as a parking lot for the uh, uh, breakers tourist guests. Uh, that's all for that one. Now, the next one here, I can't give you the date on this. I mislaid the date. I do not have the date. But the John Jacob Astor Jr. estate at the corner of Ruggles Avenue and Bellevue Avenue, it was also completely destroyed after a general alarm fire. 
and that fire took place uh, early in the evening and lasted until way until 7 o'clock the next morning. And it was under icy conditions at this fire also, and a few men got hurt. The next one was a general alarm fire at the mayor block at 72 Spring Street. This building was a four-story construction and contains furnished apartments. This building was constructed of wood, cement, blocks, and bricks. All the people in there were taken care of by the Salvation Army because they were driven out by the fire. And that's for that. And that, and that one. And I don't think you gave credit for the Red Cross. I think the Red Cross helped for those people on Spring Street. Well, that too. could be. I, uh, of course, at my age, my memory is kind of slipping, and uh, I give somebody the credit if I. That was a terrible. I, that was a that was a terrible fire there with those young people that were living right. in that building. I think the Red Cross. Yeah, because if I uh, if I slip on here, I'm glad you brought that to my attention because at my age, my memory's getting kind your of Your memory's low. perfectly good. <laughs> now, come on, your memory's oh, gorgeous. Right. <laughs> on uh, on uh, uh, January 11th of 76, a big section of the Cranston Calvert School was destroyed in a general alarm fire. It was a cold night with temperature above freezing and gave us a nice, nicey conditions. A few of the firemen received falls on the uh, uh, recovered ground, and a few were taken to the hospital with minor injuries. On May the 14th, 1973, our uh, most disastrous fire was the Walsh Brothers Furniture Store. It was totally consumed in a general alarm fire. Uh, the buildings on, involved in this fire were the Walsh Brothers, the Brownstone Building, a bicycle shop, Burke Shoe Store, a two garage, and an old parsonage up the court. I'll give you a, a summary when the alarm came in. At uh, 2.04 a.m., a telephone call was received at fire headquarters. At 2.06 a.m., an inside box was struck for box 31. At 2.08 a.m., an outside alarm struck. At 2.09 a.m., a general alarm was struck, recall, and the recall did not come in until 11.20 a.m. on the 15th. And we were at that fire all night. Uh, we received uh, help from Middletown, Portsmouth, Jamestown, Fall River, Warren, uh, and, and the Navy Department. Uh, Bristol and Swansea sent manpower only, uh, which we needed. On February 76th, this is a, just a small note of what a fireman has to contend with. On the, on the Newport Bridge, a Volkswagen with a Magnesia engine caught fire. The firemen poured water and 30 gallons of foam extinguisher liquid for one hour and 40 minutes. This engine refused to be extinguished and had to burn itself out. The cause of the fire was a broken glass line which started the fire. The next one, I come for the end, another fire. A fire swept through the third floor of the 100-year-old mansion at the corner of Bellevue Avenue and Ledge Road. The estate was known as Inchin. Firemen were at the building from 5.30 p.m. until 6 a.m. the next morning. A lot of damage was done to the building. This amounted that the owner of the building said it would take at least $700,000 to reconstruct the, uh, reconstruct the building. Uh, on November the 18th, 1883. 1983. Uh, uh, 1983. Uh, Ocean View, another large summer colony mansion on Bellevue Avenue next to the Doris Duke estate. This mansion was of wood construction and was very heavily damaged. Uh, that's all that I can tell you for the major fires that I can recall. And we have had a lot of fires throughout the city of Newport, but the few I told you about are the largest. And I think that will cover up to that thing, and you can ask me the questions, take it from uh, there. It's interesting um, to see what has been built upon some of those destroyed uh, parts. The uh, Astor one that you mentioned now has three big houses on it, I believe. Uh, yes, the condominiums on two of them, yeah. 
And uh, one fire that you didn't mention that I remembered was the uh, Linden Gate on Rhode Island yes, Avenue. Yes, I was a Dr. Terry. Went straight I was down there. To, I, to the nothing except the one that, uh, that was terrible. And uh, that was a uh, that was a tough fire, and that was a cold night too. And, and it just completely, just completely you wouldn't it, think that a big house could right, go and, so fast. Yeah, and it's a brick construction, and no. that very held it for yeah. them. No. Yeah. Well, I think that's 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 very interesting. Uh, one of the things that I had uh, expected you to talk about, but I don't think I gave you time, you mentioned about the six car trains that would come in to Newport, uh, going out, uh, bringing flowers down from Boston and going out on the boats and, and the Boston people coming down the train. You didn't mention anything about the circus coming to town. Oh, yes. Well, I can remember that uh, because the circus used to come in by train at that time and uh, it was at the uh, at the railroad yard and when the children were small, I used to take the children down there and see them unload the uh, uh, the uh, uh, animals from the and the horses from the uh, circus cars. And in the afternoon, after everything was all set up, we'd take the children out to see the uh, see the circus at the uh, circus grounds. No more circus. No. Let's pause a minute. Just as a, a, a finish up of this wonderful collection of reminiscences, uh, have you got some little story about um, something that is lost and no longer in town? Well, years ago, uh, we had uh, uh, two men selling fish, and they had a wagon. And uh, when the mother bought the fish, uh, he'd throw the uh, piece of newspaper on the top of the uh, on the side of the truck and clean the fish for her and, uh, and fold it in the newspaper. And uh, looking back today to see what's going, if you had anything you got the newsprint, you uh, according to statistics, you would be poisoned. But we never got anything on that. We 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 seen it in that uh, at that time, and uh, we always had plenty of fish. And then if the fish truck didn't come along, we would go along. Uh, the docks, and uh, they'd be unloading the fish, and they'd throw a fish on you, and we'd take the fish home. Just an extra one. Just as an extra one, along for fish docks, because we traveled along the waterfront, and we were children, and know what they were, and it was great to have the fish. And then another thing, uh, uh, speaking about fish, my father used to get the, uh, uh, get some codfish and clean the codfish, and we had these old butter tubs, and he used to salt this down, and uh, that was our supply of fish for the winter. Because mother would I'd take that out in the morning and wash the salt off the fish, and we'd have codfish, and then she'd make codfish cakes. And there's nothing any better. And there's nothing than better than the codfish cakes, and uh, right out of there browned with a nice dose of ketchup, and uh, you'd fill yourself on those codfish cakes. Another thing that I can remember is uh, uh, that I was down the gas house uh, uh, picking uh, coke uh, previous to World War One, and at the uh, uh, Naval Torpedo Station, uh, we had uh, uh, two aerial towers when they first came in to, uh, to contact the ships at sea. And uh, the wires were spread between those big towers, and on that, uh, where they were manufacturing, they, uh, years later they had a powerhouse, uh, powder house on Rose Island where they kept all the, uh, all the explosives. And uh, they had a little few explosives on the uh, torpedo station right in the center of the building. And I can remember looking out, and I heard this blast, and looked up, and I saw these flames going right up between the two towers, and they had an explosion on it. And this was in the winter time. And uh, uh, to get to the torpedo station, the ice was so thick that uh, the bodies were thrown in the air, and they had to pick the arms and legs up from the people uh, on the ice. And uh, that was around uh, noontime when that happened. And uh, at that time, that uh, uh, the uh, the harbor was frozen up, completely frozen up, and we could walk from King Park on the ice right out to the entrance of the Newport Harbor. And the coal that came into the city here came in by coal barges. And uh, the uh, attendants for the coal barges had their wives or the girlfriends with them when they were in a tow. And uh, we'd go out that way and uh, We'd ask for some coal, and they'd throw a bag of coal down. And we'd take the coal on the sled. They'd take it out of the out of the coal, 
barges, and we cast the coal across the ice, no trouble at all. And the harbor hasn't frozen over no, for years? No, the harbor years hasn't years for years, but that was the time that uh, you could do that. But previous to that, uh, uh, previous to the time that I mentioned, uh, there was a uh, house was moved across from Jamestown on the ice. So that, that'll give you an idea how thick the harbor was and how the ice was frozen in the bay. And some of the boats that couldn't uh, come in, they couldn't penetrate the air. Uh, they couldn't get the entrance to the harbor because the ice was so heavy. That uh, Bay Voyage Hotel over there yeah. in Jamestown is going strong. They're going to make that into condominiums, yeah, they yeah, say. Yes. And, and uh, you're looking at that uh, Bay Voyage, I'm looking at the Bay View, too. And that's an old one. And uh, I can't understand why that hasn't gone up out flames because it's, it's flimsy uh, uh, construction. It was constructed years ago. And that's a that's about a six-story building. They, Wouldn't tried, it, it, they tried to get it... Uh, reconditioned but they couldn't get it uh, the, the, the historical what, well no yeah. they, there was an individual that tried it mm -hmm. but they couldn't get it uh, mm -hmm. fireproofed enough mm -hmm. so they can't have people yeah. sleeping there so, so I uh, uh, looking uh, looking back uh, and uh, reviewing things here and uh, it's a great thing to uh, uh, look back and I, I can remember uh, uh, on that uh, uh, the square at the park near the bandstand and on the when baseball we had a baseball set up on the uh, on the YMCA and we saw all the plays with where the ball went to and everything on the green flag background that was on the uh, YMCA in other words you could see the whole ball game just like you do today at the television but the the objects were moving around where the ball went it was a mechanically controlled uh, baseball board in the Y? No, on the outside of the Y. On the outside of the Y, facing the square, facing the park. I don't think I quite understand that. Well, you look at the baseball now, you look at your television. Mm -hmm. All right. You see the baseball game on the television. At the, those days, we didn't have anything like that. But there was like a, we'll explain it to you, there was a big billboard and had a baseball court lined out on there and the players and every time somebody hit the ball, the ball would go to whatever part of the of the field the ball landed. And every, all the people, spectators, would be on the square and in the park watching the ball game, just the same as today as you would in television. Who moved the balls? Well, they had a mechanical man with men behind moving the balls when they got that, when they got the telephone call. I see. And, and, and that was right on there. And they they moved, the, moved the men to the different bases. And if there was a, a quake between the second and third base, uh, you would see them uh, tally back and forth until somebody was out or made the, uh, made the run to home plate. Isn't that great? Yeah. I never heard of that. It yes. well, didn't that last very long. Did they have that very long? Well, it, it changed around, and then the uh, uh, radio came in and everything else, and uh, of course that diminished. But that was what we saw, the uh, World Series. That was just for the, for the World Series. Great. I didn't... That's... that's so that was that, uh, that was a long time ago. That's great. I think that your husband might... He might have. He's never mentioned that. that. Yeah, yeah, I remember that on the, uh, on the baseball uh, billboard in front of the uh, YMCA face on the square. No, he never told me about that, and, and mm -hmm. I, that, that's, that's just great, because he was living there across the street from the square at that time. Uh, you mentioned about the fish uh, uh, peddler coming around to the house. Uh, tell me who else delivered in those days in the street so that your mother didn't have to go to, uh, to market. Well, there wasn't too much there unless you got uh, your grocery. Uh, you did the milk, I know. Yeah, I did the milk. And then uh, for the groceries, we'd have to go to the store. And uh, uh, at that time, there wasn't any A&P stores there. The only A&P store when I was a small child is uh, uh, right next to the uh, brick market on the, on the square, the city building of the brick market where the art gallery is now. Mm -hmm. And next to that, there was a A&P store. And every Friday night, we'd have to come uptown with a wagon and load my wagon down and carry it all the way downtown with the supplies for the week. Of course, we still have the corner stores that in case of emergency, we got the few uh, uh, goods that we needed. But, uh, uh, and then the coal, the coal that was delivered by truck. And if you had uh, three or four tons of coal, the two men on, the, uh, on a horse-drawn uh, wagon, 
that just take the cellar window out, put the chute in, and then the wagon was divided in different types of coal, and you know just how much each person would get. And oil, uh, there were men around here that delivered, because we had kerosene, <coughs> and they would deliver the kerosene. If they didn't deliver the kerosene, you'd have to go up to the Standard Oil Company and uh, wait to off and, uh, with a wagon and carry... You take your own uh, container. Containers, five-gallon containers, because that was our source of supply for the, uh, uh, for the lamps. But at that time, we didn't have too much until the gas came out. And if you had the gas, uh, uh, you were, you were lucky. Everything was fine. But still in all, even with the gas, a lot of people had to stick by the, uh, the uh, kerosene lamps because they couldn't pay for the, for the gas. Yeah. Because the gas was manufactured here at the gas plant. Where, where they're trying to, the gas plant was right at the uh, corner of Wellington Avenue and opposite uh, Lee Avenue. And that's where they want to put up another a series of hotels. You haven't seen it. They've already done it. No, not at the one at the Navio. They've they've they're marking it down right at the present time. They've got something built up there within the last month. I I was so amazed. I went down there and I got this tremendous building. Not right where the gas tanks were, mm -hmm. but when you have you been? You must go into town that way. Well, well by, I think you're, you're you're referring to. I think you're you're referring to the condominium that was built on on uh, on Harrington Street. Yes. yes, and you know what was on Harrington Street? The dogs. That was the dog pound. Now, speaking of the dog pound, I don't know whether they turned up that uh, uh, ground before they put that building down, but that dog pound was in there for years. Now, uh, that ground must be saturated. So maybe about five or six years after this building is up, uh, the people, the tenants in there will be getting a, a bad odor uh, from, the, uh, from that building. Well, let's hope that they turn that ground out and then dug that, cut of that dirt somewhere else. And that's the same story that you referred to on the condominiums, uh, condominiums on, on Harrington Street. They're going to put this up on the gas company uh, building, and that soil is so saturated with tar oil that after a few years, that will come back, and that you will get the smell through those buildings. And I, it, nobody knows it any better than me, because we had a, a second alarm. There was a fire, an explosion in the gas house, and the uh, twos and the threes, that's the fire station down the neck, and the twos from Young Street, they went down to the fire and they couldn't contend with it, so they struck a second alarm. So we came down and uh, up the corner, we laid in uh, to the hydrant at the corner, the next hydrant, the nearest hydrant that wasn't used, and we started going across the, the lawn, and I went uh, in, and I went up to my hips in a pit with tar oil. And Mrs. McFarland, and uh, had her job helping me to do that. And she had to wash me down. But I'll tell you why. Because I had long johns on. It was the winter time, and that oil was saturated into the long johns and right through to my body. And Mrs. McFarland had to wash me down with kerosene. Now that's going to be a great problem for those people so down that, there. So that's what I, I hope that they, they dig down far enough to see how far down that this is, because the gas tank that gas tank must have gone down 40 feet in the ground. When it uh, when it's filled up, it would be up above, and, but she, just like an elevator shaft, she would she would drop down when the gas was uh, depleted. So that's a, that's another thing that I can tell you about that. And uh, well, one more thing, you asked us something that was interesting. Uh, I used to carry over the golf club, and in the later years when the cars came out, uh, Mr. Connell, uh, he came to town here, married a Newport girl, and uh, he got the contract of, uh, of taking the caddies from the uh, uh, from Wellington Avenue until uh, to the golf club for the, in the morning, and then in the evening he would bring us back. And of course, there's a lunch period when things were quiet. Uh, we'd go hunting for balls, and in the rough and in the pond, and we'd get the balls and come back. And uh, Mr. Connell would uh, bring us back and uh, and drop us off at Wellington Avenue. And at Wellington Avenue. Uh, there was a store, a little store, candy store, and part grocery store run by Miss Julia Sullivan and her brother Timothy. And in the uh, thing, we used to take the golf balls in there, and, and we'd sell the golf balls, and she sometimes would get two cents and three cents for the golf balls. And Mrs. Sullivan had the idea, she said, oh, look, Roy, she said to me, she says, look, she said, try to double your money. And you know what the new slot machines are today, you just put your money in, and you pull the handle. But in that time, 
uh, these, these slot machines have a lot of a lot of brass escutcheon pins on there, and you put your penny in, and the, the penny went through the escutcheon pins right down. And if it came into the into the star, you would get you would get a candy bar. But most of the time, it was rigged so that it would go into Julia Sullivan's pocket. <laughs> and that when we got home, we had no golf balls, we had no candy bar, we had no more pennies. So that's the story. <laughs> Uh, uh, that, did that keep you from being a gambler the rest of your life? Well, I don't you know. We we played in that. Another thing that we uh, uh, we used to do, and they're speaking about it when I was children here on uh, on uh, Rosalie's Avenue here, right up on the on the East Snow Road, right here, coming up. Uh, uh, there was a fire alarm box in the corner, and of course, around Halloween time, they had, the cops were on bicycles, and. Uh, uh, we were on the corner here, and uh, we pulled the fire alarm box on the corner of East North Road and Rosneath Avenue. And then the cop came along, and he was hiding in the bushes somewhere. They tried to catch us with the with the bicycle, but we ran up what they known on the upper part of East North Road as Weedon's Hill. We went up Weedon's Hill, and we knew where, where we were going. And then he dropped his bicycle, and he ran after us and said, I'll catch you, fellas, yet. And he kept out of this. come on, try and catch us. So we ran through, and we turned off to the right, and there was a stable there. And there was two pieces of wire, and we knew where those two pieces of wire were. And uh, we jumped over the wire, and of course he wasn't familiar with the territory. And of course that was the back part of the barn. And uh, uh, I'll tell you that uh, in the back part of the barn, all the horse manure was piled up in a flat pile stretched out. He came across and hit that wire, and he fell face first right into that one, into that manure. But he never caught us. But that's another tale of just. Oh, yes. that's a beautiful story. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful. I think that's a lovely ending. The poor policeman and your terrible pranks, which of course in those days were never as bad as what they try to do now. Well, oh, uh, uh, well, uh, years ago, my father had a derby. He always wore a derby, black derby, and uh, he was he's coming out of the Jack Shay bar room, and uh, and he started up the street, and all of a sudden a snowball came around and hit him and knocked his derby off. He turned around and looked around, and there was about eight children there, uh, boys, on the corner. I wasn't one of them, but there was, uh, I was on the other corner, and he came down, and he picked the right one that picked him up. He turned him up, and he took him, and he turned him down and struggled his nose right into the snow. He said, now if you do it, he just wipe his face off and go over and pick my head up and put it in my head. So he wiped, the boy wiped the, my father's uh, hat off and put on my father's head. He says, don't me catch you doing that again. So that's another incident in, in early childhood. But uh, we, we've looked around. We've, ca we've caught mackerel fishing down off the stone pier. We caught uh, smelts, and they were uh, fried little smelts. We put them in the frying pan, bring them home, and it's delicacy for us to get that. But you had to work for it, because in those days, you didn't have anything. My mother ran a, uh, a book account. In, in the store, in the candy store in the corner of Annie Reynolds on Potter Street. And uh, uh, she, she used to pay that every time my father got paid. And at that time, we had great big bills. The, the bills were about 10 inches long. <laughs> and after my mother paid the bills, and she paid the bills in, in O'Hanley's grocery store on the corner of Narragansett Avenue, and Annie Reynolds on the corner of Potter Street, and the Sullivan Brothers had a store between uh, Hammond and Narragansett.